Hello, Lyric Armstrong, your real estate agent and advocate. We are here to talk about the YSL um, Young Thug case. So I've said this before, you know, is this a RICO case to determine if this is a YSL gang, even though the defense's assertion is that they are a record company or, pro or production of some sort? Or is this really about a judicial mob? I don't know. I don't know. Curious minds. Curiosity kills the cat sometimes. But nonetheless, we are still here talking about the ex parte because ex parte is a hearing that some have called a secret hearing. This hearing was secretive, but it's not necessarily what ex parte means. Ex parte means an ex party without a party. And consequently, they are put on notice. So they should get a notice. This is what the meeting should be about. They gleam a little bit about why they don't need to be involved, why it's best that they're not involved, whatever the reasonings are. And consequently, they get to waive their right and say, okay, yeah, you're right. We waive our right to be there. Go ahead and have this ex parte meeting. Otherwise, they would say, oh, no, wait, Your Honor, no, we think we should be there. This is very pertinent to us. We should be there. Well, um, this particular occurrence, I don't think they even got noticed that there's going to be a meeting. So they didn't get to waive their right. They, uh, the defense asserted that they never waived their right to the meeting because they were unnoticed of it. And they ended up getting pieces of what happened, right? But there's more to the reality of the wrong doing of having the ex party. The ex party without notice is one wrongdoing. The content, the substance of what the meeting was about was a lot of was, was a lot of wrongdoing. And so you have the judge saying, I don't need to know the sub sum and substance. I don't need to know the sum and substance. Meaning I don't need to know the substance of information, the summary of it and the totality of what was said. I just need to know who told you. I just wanna know who told you what happened because it's, um, it's showing that, that, that there's a snitch or that there's some kind of sacrosanct that's being exposed and, and, and pierced in his court, in his chambers. However, <laughs> the judge, of course, gets to his feeling as to who it was and the confirmation of that comes down later in life, but wanted you to see more substantively as to what was actually going on in the hearing that makes the hearing so bad, really, really bad and why. So let's get into what makes the hearing bad and why. At this moment in time, I welcome you to the stream. Again, Lyric Armstrong, real estate agent and advocate. Do me a great favor, like, share, subscribe. And let's get into some of the documents. So the document here is a motion to recuse the chief judge, Ural Glanville, which his name is very close to someone I know. <laughs> so I wanna make sure I don't know him. <laughs> we are not associated, but nonetheless, um, I saw some other instances where he was kind of doing a good job. So I, I don't want to be too disparaging, but overall, I do wonder about this judge overall, because when we're playing rap songs as a piece of evidence and not uh, treating them like freedom of speech, I'm concerned about where the justice system is going. Anyway, so they filed a motion. This is the state of Georgia. Um, DeMonte Kendricks is another one of the defendants. That's not Young Thug. I believe his name is Mr. Williams, Jeffrey Williams, I believe. So Mr. Kendrick's attorney is filing um, by and through his underside counsel motion to recuse Chief Judge Glanville um, from continuing to preside over the present case. So they want him to get off the bench. Like you are showing bias or so there's some inconsistencies and we don't think that you have the ability to be impartial and call the balls and stripes in an impartial manner. So you should, in fact, get off the bench. That's what this is about. Let's see if we get some more into it. Um, does it say present the request that the present the trial by, oh, temporarily be halted. They want the trial in and of itself to halt until the proceeding of the motion, this motion to recuse, is heard by another judge. So that's the request. There's nothing too abnormal about that. You want an impartial judge to determine if, in fact, you, as the presiding judge, can in fact continue with um, presiding over this particular case. Um, the case has been going on 90 days. So, uh, you know, he obviously does not approve of this uh, motion, even though it's probably in the best interest. Okay, let's see. It is vital to the functioning of the courts that the public believe in the absolute integrity and impartiality of its judges. And judicial recusal serves as a linchpin for the underlying proposition that a court should be fair and impartial. This is Monday versus um, Magnolia Advance Materials. It is a Georgia case. However, 
So when you are citing cases, you want to cite the case that your first desire is to cite the case that is within that particular system, that state. So you want to start with your state cases. And then sometimes you might find that there is no state case that really um, gets into what you're looking at, which is really rare right now, but maybe there isn't. Um, So consequently, you may look at a sister state, a federal state case and use those, but they have lesser weight when you're dealing with trial court. They'll be like, oh yeah, I want to see my Georgia my Georgia uh, cases. And this is a 2018 case. You have knowledge that this Georgia court is very concerned about how recent the cases are. And I think that goes into, they're, they are going, they are um, making certain changes, right? So they're going through a lot of changes in their statutes. They, they talked about it, that they have passed some new things. So consequently, they want things that are a little more recent. That can be good to a certain extent, because if you are using very old cases to um, be discriminatory or to be um, unjust, and because you know Jim Crow laws are discriminatory and unjust, that's something that Georgia would have had in place at some point in time, that would be problematic. However, cases that are old are not always bad. It just means that they've stood the test of time and they haven't been shepherdized or you know, they haven't been turned uh, turned over and appealed to a point where they are now no longer law. And it's every um, public desire, belief, and concern that they have impartial judges. Now, let's sip a tea or two. Does everybody believe all their judges are impartial? I mean, if we look at the Supreme Court, are we, are we feeling like we have impartiality in our judge judicial system? <laughs> oh, we might could argue against that, couldn't we? But the idea is we should. All right, the present case involves 65 counts of RICO indictment against 28 individuals. This is an important fact because this, when we get to the substantive information in the affidavit, 28 individuals means something to you. So remember 28 individuals. This is about 28 people. I I know there's five in the court right now, but 28 of them are looking to be, you know, looking for their trial date or so 23 of them are looking for their trial dates. Five of them are in trial and 23 are left. All right, the selection started in January. Trial began in November. Yes, it's been going on forever in three days. There's six, de- oh, six defendants. Okay, there's six present defendants. So we got 22 uh, left individuals. And so Mr. Kendrick has been denied bond and he has been incarcerated for over two years. So he is not allowed to bond himself out. So this now helps me to understand one of the statements that was made that the def- uh, defense attorney was, their practice was going under um, because of this case being 90 some odd days long, you don't have a working defendant to pay the bill. And once you're in a case and the case is, um, in trial, it's not normal for the judge to say, okay, well, we'll switch out attorneys. Usually that's like very, very beginning, or if there's a major issue and it doesn't have, um, a really substantial effect to the timeline of the case, then they'll let the attorneys, um, switch or, you know, uh, get rec- get recused, get removed from the case. But it can't be to the detriment of the defendant, especially in criminal court. And so the judge denied that attorney. But now I can understand. I don't know that it's this particular attorney. I'm just saying in general, if these, if these defendants are not allowed to have bond and they're not allowed to go and make money and to support their families and consequently pay their attorney bills, they're so, and, you're, and this is two years already that they have been in jail and then the trial itself has been 90 days and we're still in the, you know, prosecution's case in chief. So if we're still in the beginning parts of, of, of everything, I mean, oh Lord, <laughs> you just have some kind of sympathy or empathy for those that are in that position. And you can argue, did they put themselves there? I don't know. Cause I don't, as far as I'm concerned, I remain to the innocent until proven guilty that that's what we have as our law. And I remain there. Everyone is innocent until proven guilty. So I don't treat them guilty until they actually are. Okay, I think I'm blocking something here. All right, so Friday, June 7th, Mr. Copeland was sworn in. Now here comes problem number two. Um, First problem was the notice of the ex parte was not given to the defense so that they could decide if they were gonna waive their rights. Second problem, Mr. Copeland is a sworn in witness as of June 7th. Now, do not be confused. When you're sworn in until your testimony is done, you're sworn in. So if you're going in on Friday, 
And then say you testify. He ended up pleading the fifth. But let's just say you're testifying and there's more information, more questions. The other side wants to ask you whatever, you know, you, you got this process going and it's the end of the court day. And the court says, OK, we're going to resume on Tuesday because Monday is a holiday. Do not talk to anyone about your testimony. You're still sworn under oath. So when you walk in on Tuesday, the question is, do you know that you're still under oath? Yes, I'm still under oath. You are still under oath in that time. You're sworn in. You are you are a witness sworn in. So consequently, just because you're not in the courtroom witness box, you're still a witness. So you can't have conversations with others about the case in any factor. Your attorney, that's an exemption. You can talk to your attorney because you have right to counsel. But as far as like the prosecution, um, the defense attorney, your mama, your friends, you can't talk to them. No, no talking. <laughs> Shh, no talking. Until you get back into the courtroom and you get released as a witness. When you get released as a witness, then you can start talking. So he was sworn in on Friday, June 7. And they say he was warned that he would be incarcerated if he refused to testify after after they had already granted him immunity and Copeland, the witness still refused to testify on that day. He still refused it. So he, un he was informed that he would be incarcerated. He was informed that um, he had immunity and he still wanted to plead the fifth and refused to testify. So court said, okay, we're going to return at 8.30 a.m. on Monday. And we're going to find out what Mr. Copeland wants to do and give him some time to think about it. It's basically um, what they're saying. So on the 10th, Monday, 8.30 a.m., the defense counsel was present in the courtroom, 830. Um, they were allowed to be seated by nine, which is odd because we return at 830. Maybe trial doesn't start tonight. I don't know. But anyway, they weren't allowed to be seated until nine, whatever that whatever that is about. So but even then, defense had to wait. They wait. And some of the issues defense counsel waited and waited. <laughs> some of the issues about waiting is uh, depending on what type of a counselor you are depending on what type of billing you have you're pay you're paying your defense um attorney by the hour they're billing by the hour so as they're waiting and waiting and waiting you know they're billing under most circumstances and so they didn't get to hear from the judge two hours later so they're saying between 11 a.m and 11 30 that's at least two hours later could be upwards of three hours depending on if you're counting the 8 30 a.m but to the to 11 30 a.m nevertheless that's at least two hours and the judge just takes the bench and announces that the witness is prepared to testify. So very new development from where we left off on Friday. Since the, the, the witness is not testifying, he pleads the fifth. And now all of a sudden, here we are, and he is ready to go. Okay, judge, your honor, okay. <laughs> so um, in, is that abnormal? Probably not. But under certain circumstances that we've heard of relative to this ex parte hearing, they're, they're in lies the um, abnormality and consequently uh, be, you know, you're def if you're a, uh, an attorney, you're already like curious and like all into, all into the business, right? But if you're the client, make sure your attorney is being curious. Like, well, why did he change his mind? What got into him? You know, find out. So anyway, attorney Brian Steele, <clears throat> who is in fact the counselor for uh, defendant Jeffrey Williams, inquired with the court as to the delay and what had occurred prior to the judge taking the bench and his inquiry was not accepted this is a pretty way of saying he inquired right no he kind of like ayo <laughs> he ayo the judge like ayo like i heard that you was and i see that you had and what what was what and he really like kind of you know Mo molly walked him <laughs> in the court like he was really going for the judge but you know he was being an advocate. Uh, he was zealously advocating for his client. So it was unknown to the members of the defense during the waiting period um, that morning upon information and belief. So meaning that they received this information, they have this information on good authority, meaning that they find this the, the informant to be credible when they say and belief. Like we believe it. Like it's not just hyperbole we're not just coming up with stuff to you know bottle the court down with we kind of actually believe this this is like really credible people telling us that something went down so consequently you know we we, we want the court to know <laughs> we need to figure this out like you need to be honest with us and tell us what's up so information belief on the party meeting was held in the chambers um that same morning where these individuals the judge 
obviously, because his chamber is like his personal office. Okay, so the judge, <laughs> ADA Love, which is the district attorney, Love, uh, the young lady with the short hair, the one who's always like rocking and rolling her with the body language who needs to calm down in court. <laughs> yeah, right. and ADA Helton, which um, seemingly is the one who is um, asking the questions of the witness. And other members of the DA's office, deputies, deputies are normal, but just remember deputies look like deputies. They look like they're there for like security reasons, but they're always going to be around the judge um, when it's like members of the public around. And then the sworn witness. Now, this is the most damaging part of that statement. Sworn witness. Why is it damaging? Because when the witness is sworn in, He's a witness on the stand. The things that he says is important to all parties. And the defendants have a constitutional right to, um, to, com to confront, which just means to, to, to see, to hear, to, you know, to ask questions of witnesses that are, that are adverse to them. So witnesses are going to come up and say, oh, uh, Jeffrey Williams did an, an illegal act. Jeffrey Williams asked the question to say, well, how do you know that he did that? What what makes you think he did that? Oh, I heard that on the street. Oh, you heard it. Who told you? Oh, I can't remember who it was. Oh, I can't remember. You know, those type of things is, are um what we, we what we mean by confront. Okay, so I don't want to act like I'm supporting other Ill illegal activity. I'm talking about the actual legal <laughs> realm of confronting a witness. So consequently, when you have a sworn witness, this when is the sworn June seventh. So to have an expert say hearing with the witness, and the defense has no knowledge of it, this is really a problem because he's sworn in. Everything he says matters. It matters to the defense. The defense needs to know what he's saying because he's technically a witness on the stand. So he should be in open court. So <clears throat> um, no members of the defense was present. Okay, so we know they have, We know they weren't present. Um, wait, what did I miss? I missed something. Uh, uh, oh, now no member of the council was present at the ex party meeting despite the subject matter of the meeting and it being a critical phase of trial. This particular witness is where the prosecution is hanging his hat. This is like the cornerstone of the information. This witness is saying, I know this transpired for whatever reason he knows it, right? And so it's, very important for the defense to understand what is it that he thinks he knows, how he thinks he knows it. Um, is it true that he's, you know, he's, he's accurately knowing or is he just, you know, getting his memory crossed or is he having a vendetta against the defense? Like, you know, they, they have a, they have a need to know. It's not like um, they don't need to know. They have a need to know. They have a right to know. And let's see if we can get down to, some of the substance of, I think those were things. Okay, so here, I think this is where we need to be. Okay, so, he, so, as we saw, Brian Steele is like, hey, yo, judge, hey, hey, look, I, I don't wanna believe what I had heard, but I, I heard some things. I heard you was doing some things and, you know, Hope the court takes issue with this because this is a major issue and the court of course is like who told you who's the snitch who's the bird who's the parrot who's the parrot who's the bird? like like real weird stuff right <laughs> what's going down so consequently it's like you're going to jail go on jail we're going to have um we're going to move on with the witness because you're wasting trial time you won't tell me who told you prosecution had enough gumption to say look <laughs> he needs to be in court because <laughs> we're getting ready to why does he need to be in court? Do you say prosecution? Because we're getting ready to have Mr. Copeland testify. He's the defense attorney. He needs to be here so that we don't have a mistrial or some kind of issue with his with the defendant not having his attorney present for very crucial testimony. Something like that ex parte? Huh? Something like that ex parte? Do you want to explain yourself, uh, prosecution? Do you want to explain why the ex parte was so uncrucial, even though he was a witness still on the stand and under oath? because he was sworn in on June 7th. Yeah. Sometimes we make good arguments when it's in our favor and forget that is the same argument, even though it's not in our favor. <laughs> like the argument is the argument. It's good when it's good and it's, you know, doggone it. It's still good, even if it doesn't help you. 
All right. So let's see. The next thing is one or more members of defense counsel were later made aware. Okay. So they, they figured it out. Someone had told them. And this is upon now upon information, belief means I got it on good authority. I don't know if to be true directly, but the person who told me how I found out these are very credible, you know, pieces of informants. And consequently, it could have been like the transcript itself, because we know that it was recorded, the recording. It could have been a person. We found out later it was a person that was witness that um, has no reason to lie. So consequently, we that's the reason. So but everything starts off with upon information and belief means I have it on good authority. All right. Copeland announced that he would invoke his fifth. So you put him in the ex party meeting. He said, nope, I'm playing the fifth. Okay. Copeland stated that he would sit in jail for two years rather than testify. Remember, on June 7th, on that Friday, they told him we can put you in jail for pleading the fifth and not um, speaking because you have an immunity deal and a part of your deal is to communicate these, the facts. Well, they probably told him our facts. But anyway, communicate what you know. And he said, okay, well, I'll sit in jail. This is during the ex party on Monday morning. Then judge tells the witness that the judge uh, could, oh, I said, yeah, could, I'm sorry, I'm reading it wrong, that he could keep that sworn witness incarcerated until all the additional defendants were tried. That's where the 28 comes into play. Now, mind you, think you got to be Mr. Copeland. Now, I don't. I don't want, like I told you, I'm not, I'm not trying to disparage the man. I just don't think there's some, some capacity there. But let's just say all faculties and capacity at the highest level. Be you, be you, be the witness. You are pleading the fifth because whatever reason, right? Pleading the fifth, they say, they tell you, you're going to have to sit in jail. You said, well, I'd rather sit in jail for two years and testify. And then the judge comes back with, well, you know, I can keep you in for longer until all of the 22 other defendants who are waiting for trial. They're not even on trial yet. And so all of the other 22 defendants are tried, not just the six defendants you see today in trial. Hmm. How do you feel? How do you feel? You feel like testifying? I don't know. Sounds, sounds like a little pressure to me. You just might make you want to testify. Okay, so judge, I mean judge, no, I'm sorry. Um, district attorney, <clears throat> uh, Love and Hilton, they also inform the witness that there were over a dozen defendants left to try. So if you didn't know that there were 28 and maybe you thought, oh, okay, it's another six people. They're like, nah, now nah, we got at least over a dozen. We got at least over 12 more that we got. We're going to testify that we know we're going to testify at least 12 dozen more. So if you did some simple math, you got six now, you got two dozen. Um, you got two more, you got a dozen left. So if you're taking six each trial, that's two, four, six. That's sitting in jail for six years, just not to testify to plead the fifth today. I mean, you know, just, just some rough math. It's probably not even anywhere near close <laughs> as long as they take to try these cases, it, it seems. But just, just think, you're Mr. Copeland. You're the witness. This is what it sounds like when you're sitting in this ex parte meeting. The judge is telling you, I can keep you here for as long as necessary for all defendants in, in um, concerned with this RICO case. Then the ADAs are telling you, look, we got at least 12 more people to, to testify, uh, to um, prosecute. We got six now and we got 12 later. And you're taking them six by six. Okay. <laughs> Sounds like a long, a lot longer. So upon um, information belief, following the above portion, this is a conclusion. You're concluding that that's what happened. However, it's a reasonable conclusion in my opinion that the judge has been at least a witness, this is what they say, at least a witness to the ADA, you know, trying to put more pressure on the defendant, I mean, on the witness to testify. But I believe the judge was a participant. If this bullet point is accurate, that the judge informs the witness that he has the, the power to keep him incarcerated until the additional defendants were tried, this is information. However, in the context of we're in ex parte hearing, we're in the chambers and we want you to testify and we want to find out why you're pleading the fed and you need to testify because you're a witness and you need to tell what happened because you're a witness. This is the atmosphere, whether that is said or not, there is like the implication of the room. The defense is not in the room. I believe his attorney was there, but of course that was his, um, his temporary attorney for the, for the moment because his normal attorney was on vacation or, you know, he had something else to do. 
So he had a stand in, even though we find out that um, Copeland and that particular female attorney had representation in the past. That doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, that's his bestie. You know, he wanted the other guy there and the other guy was not there. Anyway, um, I think it's quite coercive to have a judge tell you, I have powers. Just think that. I have powers. And the ADA to come and say, yeah, and those powers can last a while because we've, we've got 12 people at least to, to deal with. 12 other people. We're dealing with these six, we've got 12 other people. Just that is like, dude, <laughs> I don't know what you guys say in judges' chambers and ex party meetings because, you know, obviously, if you're an ex party, you don't know. But to have this right here memorialized in such a way, it's such an injustice to the citizens because if YSL is a gang, the handling of this case, you like you're like mistrial or appeals overrule. Like you you are damaging the case with the activities of some of the um this behavior. This behavior here is the most damage is, it damages the case. And that was some of the issues I had with um Massachusetts versus Karen Reed. Like if she did it, I don't know how you find intent it doesn't sound it doesn't the evidence doesn't give intentional but if she did it the way you mishandled the evidence the way you talked to witnesses years later the way you failed to detail reports the way you um witnesses say the tail light was in one um one minor damage but you present a very full damaged tail light and don't account for reasoning as to you know how why and then you know i don't know it's kind of one of those things where maybe she did hit him and then you felt like well we need more evidence to to show that she hit him or maybe she hit him and all the evidence was there but because you did not separate the witnesses when you were interviewing them you did not write full reports you recused the department, but the department still remained actively involved in the investigation. You failed to investigate any other potential uh, possibilities. The coroner gives you reason to say, look, there's something beyond this theory of hit by a car. And I don't know that that's the case. So I can't really rule it as a homicide. Instead of saying, wait, what happened? Let's see. Well, let's go back and research and figure out if there's any other possibilities. You hammer down into your theory of the case that you came up with within an hours of finding the body that you didn't even document well <laughs> like I, so bottom line that i'm saying is if you're right shame on you for not treating that officer with higher respect and retaining the evidence with out of, with impunity so that the jury could find the party guilty with out having any doubt shame on you if you're right shame on you if you're wrong for not doing the same thing so that the so that the defendant not be tried for something that she did not do so it's like right or wrong i, I you know shame on you and that's what happens here in georgia because now we're in a place where you know did they do it did it happen even if it did happen we have sloppy this and sloppy that um and so did they get away with it if they did it mm -hmm. we'll find out we're gonna find out together like what what's the dealio what happens but what we know in this ex-party meeting is so much more happened than just oh well uh we sat down together we had we, we had breakfast this morning <laughs> no that's that's way beyond that um Oh, wait, no, I don't want to go back up. I want to go down, 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 down. Okay. So upon believe, Glanville also presented the sworn witness. I want to see what this bullet point says. And upon belief is like I said, we reasonably believe this happened. Judge, please say it isn't so is what they're crying out. But the judge has admitted that it happened. One of the reasons why you know he admitted that it happened is because some of the stuff that um, Mr. Steele was asserting in his motion um, to, to find out, like, to inquire um, about the ex-party, he goes, how do you know that? Because that was an ex-party meeting. So he just, auto so that's like an automatic admission, right? Because you 
her the substance of what was said. And now you can recount the way, wait, wait, that was ex party. That was in our ex party meeting. So you should not have known that. So how do you know that? Wait a minute. So this did happen, right? So that's how you can infer that actually it happened. But <clears throat> there has to be a hearing to find out if it happened. Go through the transcripts, yada, yada, yada. All right. So also presented this word when it's with a print of the perjury statute and the false statement statute of the state of Georgia. I am moved and unmoved. It's just, it's not improper for the judge to be like, here's the law. That's, here's the law. But I am like, my mind is in the, I'm trying to be in the, 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 the witness's point of view. And I don't know how informed he is, but most witnesses are kind of, oh, I didn't mean to do that. I don't know how informed he is, but most witnesses are kind of informed relative to their rights and their ability to not be wavered and to have resolve once they've you know, decided to put the fifth and so forth. So, but the judge prints this out. His attorney is there. I don't know if this is where he feels like my attorney is not representing me. I don't know how he, how he comes to feel like she's fired. I don't want, I don't want her to be my attorney, but, um, it's almost to me, even though it's not an improper step, it's just the timing of it just kind of compounds with the coercion of, hey, I can keep you in here. I can keep you in jail, incarcerated for, you know, all the defendants. And the DA comes in and says, yeah, we got 12 more defendants. Like, we got these six and 12 more. And the judge is like, here, look, now I want you to see this perjury statute. I want, to see, I want you to see this false statement statute. You know, here's the thing. I want you to read this. I want you to know. I want you to know your rights. In that context, it kind of feels like a little extra even though it's not wrong for him to inform about the law, it's relative to the situation. It makes it um, more, more apparent that it's more, you know, coercion to get him to testify. All right. So upon the belief in Soren, uh, oh, sworn witness, Copeland stated to Hilton that if he's called to testify, he would just simply lie on the stand. All right. I'm just going to, I'm just going to lie. Hilton states to him in response, she would not prosecute that witness if he were to lie on the stand. So, Madam Hilton, you would break the law because the law does not allow an attorney to bring up a witness that they know is going to be a false witness. that's going to lie. You can't do that. You, you, the, you have to believe that your witness is telling the truth. Now, if they lie, they lie, but you have to believe that they are telling the truth. You cannot knowingly put up someone who's going to lie on the stand. Copeland says, I'm going to lie on the stand. She's like, well, I won't prosecute you for lying on the stand. I, I'm not going to prosecute you for that. What did Copeland say before on the stand? He said, I lied to, well, I guess this is after, I, I, I don't remember when he says this, this is before they go to X party or after, it's probably after because he ends up leading the fifth. Anyway. He goes, I lied to the previous police because I don't want to go to jail. I will lie to keep myself out of jail. He's now in this ex party meeting with ADA Hilton and, and, and 14 people, according to the witness. <laughs> we find this out later. That uh, he says, I'm a lie. I'm a lie on the stand. And she's like, don't worry about it. I'm not going to prosecute you. I'm not going to do anything if you lie on the stand. Huh? <laughs> okay. You, you plan on practicing law past that day? Because that's unethical. You would be disbarred for that. And then Copeland says uh, to Hilton, well, he's going to testify that he's the one who killed Donovan Thomas. Brady violation right there. Boom. There. So the ex party hearing is about getting him to testify on the stand to not plead the fifth, to understand that he has a duty because he's under an immunity deal. But it's not noticed to the other party, problem one. Two, you have coercive activity relative to, well, you still want to plead the fifth, but you don't care about being in jail for two years, but understand, I want you to do your math. I got at least to the end of all of the defendants and we got at least 12 more. That's coercive. Now you have the third instance where he says, I'm going to lie on the stand. It's, don't worry about it. I won't prosecute you for lying on the stand. Just get on the stand. And then he turns around and says, well, I'm going to say I'm the one who killed Donovan. Donovan is the the death of this gentleman, Mr. Thomas Jr., is very important to the prosecution's case because that's what they're saying. Jeff, Jeffrey Williams, Kendrick, and all the other six defendants did. Not Copeland. 
not the not the guy with the immunity deal, but all the other defendants. And so what does Hilton say? ADA Hilton responds and says that um, responds to Copeland saying that he's going to testify to killing Don being the one who actually murdered Donovan. ADA Hilton says to the witness that she would prosecute him for perjury if he in fact testified that he killed Thomas Jr. So much Brady violation. This is ridiculously wrong. So truthfully, the transcript is gonna reveal all the truth of the matter. This is what um, was told to them by the witness. So for those who are like, oh, the witness is, is she's out of line for telling. No, 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 no. Whistleblowers have protection. It's the ex party means, yes, they're supposed to be without the party. The other party doesn't know all the particulars of what's happening, but they waive their right to know when it's under certain circumstances and you give them notice so that they can waive their rights to know. You didn't do that. So you procedurally pierce the, the veil of ex party protection in the first place because you didn't handle your business, right? And then secondly, the information in the ex parte is such a problematic piece of information because it goes to the defense side that they didn't do it. And this gentleman is saying, hey, I'm the one who did it anyway. And they're saying, we didn't do this. We didn't kill this guy. And he says, yes, I'm the one who killed this guy. That's a Brady violation. Any particular piece of information that can help the defense prove that they did not do it, prosecution cannot hold back. You have to turn it over. So putting it in the cup of, or in the veiling and the covering of an ex party hearing where the information is not supposed to leave the chamber is not a true protection because whistleblowers have the protection to tell the other side, hey, guess what? There's material and critical facts to your defense being said in chambers in the uh, veil of closure for an ex-party hearing. And this is what those material facts are. One, he said he's going to lie on the stand, and they said they don't care, they will prosecute him. So they won't prosecute him. So as long as his lies don't affect their case, they're not going to prosecute him. But if his lie happens to be that he killed Donovan, they will prosecute him because that affects their case because their case says that these other six people killed Donovan and not him. That's a problem. That's a major, major problem. So you have a witness on the stand who lacks all credibility, who has told you they are uncredible, who has professed before the court, which is the judge and the ADA, that they have no credibility whatsoever. They're willing to lie on the stand. Um, they're going to say whatever. And they killed the man. Now, who's to say that they didn't kill the man? You know, what, what, what if that's not a lie? We don't know because no investigation is going down that road. All investigation is putting it on uh, Jeffrey Williams and other defendants at all. Okay. That's the problem. That is the major problem with the, um, with the ex party. So ex party hearings in and of themselves are not illegal when they're done properly. They're not illegal. There's, it's, there's times it's necessary, but you give notice to the other side, the other side waves, they're right. They understand, okay, our presence is, would be a problem or we're not necessarily needed to be there. So go ahead have your ex party hearing. That did not happen in this situation. Furthermore, what did happen in this situation was evidence was, was developed that could help the defense and was kept from the defense. That's a Brady violation. <laughs> and further beyond that, the ADA was made aware that their defendant was non-credible because their defendant is willing to lie on the stand. They profess as such, they claimed as such. And so now you're bringing the defendant to be on the stand to testify who's already told you they're gonna lie. And you don't like the way they're testifying. You're like, oh, they're not testifying to our best benefit. You know, they have attitude with us. And they did it. They already told you they were going to lie. You, sh you have now violated. Um, you, you have ethically, you have um, operated unethically under your bar to put forth uncredible witnesses. And this witness is incredible because, incredible because they have told you they are a liar on the stand under oath. <laughs> they don't care. They gonna lie. They lie, 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 lie. Lie, 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 lie all day. And you just whoop de whoop de whoop. Okay, so we get to like a whole bunch of legalese. Um, the affidavit is I think by Weinstein or Weinstein who actually asserts those particular facts that were put into the motion. So I think we're good with this particular motion to recuse because it's like legalese really means like the cases, right? 
So we're going to do GA app is the appeals court of Georgia. So um, that's what I was saying before, like the trial court does not make the law. <laughs> Judge Glam was like, not in my court, not in my they're like, wait, 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 but the, the law is, no, 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 it's not, no, yeah. The trial court does not make the law. The appeals courts, they make the law. And so, yeah, so the affidavit was by Weinstein. This is in support of the motion. Affidavit is declaration. This is them saying under penalty of perjury. So here's another thing that's really huge about the information. So in the motion, the information in and of itself, if proven, is very uh, concerning towards the legitimacy of this trial. So the outcome of this trial, I don't think anybody will, is going to believe it. Let's say they're found not guilty. Then everybody who thought they were guilty are going to be like, oh, they just are found not guilty because all of the shenanigans. If they're found guilty, everybody who's going to, who thinks that they're not guilty is going to be, this is a major injustice because of all the shenanigans. Like the shenanigans have now put a cloud on the case. And it was interesting because the judge took such offense to... I believe it was the same attorney Weinstein who said, um, there's now a cloud on the case. Don't you want to clear this up? Um, he's right. He's right. And I'm like, you got ex-party hearings. It's got this kind of information. It's a problem. But when an attorney, so affidavits and declarations are made under penalty of perjury. Anybody can make a such um, affidavit or declaration. They can, they can do this. But when an attorney does it, it has a, a substantial different type of weight. Because if you're found to be perjuring yourself, you as an individual, you go to jail, you, you, you know, you, you have time or you pay a fine or whatever, you know, whatever happens. But if you're an attorney, you go to jail, you pay a fine and your bar license is up. Your practice, your livelihood is now on the line. So attorneys who make affidavits, they're like, this is what I, this, I, I got this from the right one, baby. They're not just going to come up and assert just anything. It's going to have to be something that they can truly believe is in fact credible. And obviously Weinstein does believe in this particular informant of his because he goes and, and he gives all of the facts relative to what he is informed of regarding that particular ex party. And, and you know, just how that it lays out. So it was laid out in the motion in and of itself, but the motion has to rely on some type of evidence. And so the evidence is this document, which is the affidavit from the attorney and the attorney is attesting to he was informed of those particular um, facts that was put into the motion. OK, so that's the filing of it all and the the impropriety and the coercion and what was actually stated. OK, not not the oh, who told you? Who cares? Who is who paired it to you? Guess what a parrot does? They repeat word for word. So guess what, Your Honor? You just verified that everything that was said was word for word. It is an exact replication of what transpired. Not someone's sur summation, not someone's opinion, not someone's um, overall thought process as to what it was. It's exactly as it was because it was parroted to you word for word. What a dumb thing to say on the court. <laughs> I, couldn't even believe, I couldn't even believe he said it, but now to know what the substance of the meeting was like, he knows what was in that meeting. He knows what was said. Why would you say word for word? Huh? That's why. Why would you say that? Come now. Come, come. Okay. All right. Well, let's go to court. Get a little feel of, of what, what was happening in court. Um, Cause this filing happened and then they tried to have a hearing on it. He was like, nah, we ain't talking about this. Moving on. And, and this is Judge, uh, this is the attorney Weinstein who had the affidavit. Who's like, wait, 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 Your Honor, wait, wait, wait. We need to deal with the motion to recuse. It's a substantial motion. We have substantial reasons. It's not just because we don't like you. It's not because you're black. It's not because you're brown. It's not because we have issues, <laughs> legal issues that need to be feel that need to be figured out before we move forward. He's like, nah, 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 bro, not in my court. <laughs> For the reasons set forth in Baptiste and other cases, I'm going to deny your motion to recuse on its face. Okay. Your Honor, may I just address what you said? I, I disagree with your characterization that I am. Uh, I filed the motion as a result of any ruling. No, no, no. Well, you did in your affidavit. I'm, I'm, I'm taking in your affidavit as face value. Okay. All right. I'm yes. I'm not contesting where you got the information from. At least not yet. I'm not contesting where you got the information from in right now. I'm not contesting if you got it from a witness. I'm not contesting if you got it from my court reporter, my deputies. I'm not contesting where you got the information from. I'm taking your affidavit at face value. So are you confirming that this is exactly what happened? Yes. But 
I'm just saying that because it, it also encompasses that I made a ruling. And as a result of that, if I make a ruling and you don't like it, then every, every litigant will say, I want to recuse you, Judge Smith or Judge Lee. So the Baptiste case is stating that if the judge makes a ruling, which we really need to be careful about, let's be real, it's more along the lines of the rulings of the court to keep the case moving. You can't just stop court and say, I don't like your ruling. We're going to have a motion to recuse you. You can't be the judge over this anymore just because the ruling is against you. And that's atypical in the circumstances of the objections. And that's why objections, if they're overruled or whatever, you'll hear attorneys say, well, I want to be heard on it. I need the record to reflect X, Y, Z, because they are trying to preserve the record. So when they go up on appeal, they can say this was the issue that the judge materially did wrong because I, you know, I put up this objection and legally this doesn't work and he still overruled it. So just because you object to something and you get a rule, you don't get to stop and recuse the, the judge, you know, right on the surface in the minute. That's what Baptiste law, uh, case law is about. He's asserting that to say, in your affidavit, you say I made a ruling. His affidavit doesn't say that. His affidavit says that you improperly held a hearing. And in the hearing, you did illegal activity of coercion. And beyond the coercion, then you had um, ADA improperly uh, accept, that you witnessed ADA accept the um, sworn witness to say he will lie on the stand. And he's going to lie about being the murderer or that he is the murderer and ADAs won't won't prosecute him for lying on the stand, but they will prosecute him for saying that he's the murderer, whether he is or isn't. So you witness that. So we have material evidence that says that my, my, my client didn't do it. That witness did it. You're a witness to the fact that he said it. So we need to have a trial to find out if you witness that he said it. And if so, then we need to have a mistrial for this case. Like we have to have hearings. So we have to, he's like, no, 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 no. You didn't like my ruling. Your ruling what? What was your ruling? What did you rule on? Did you rule that he could lie on the stand? Did you rule that, um, <clears throat> that you know, that, that you would coerce him into being on the stand? Did you rule that he would not get prosecuted for lying? Did you rule that he, in fact, would get prosecuted if he said he was the, um, the murderer of the, the victim? What, what was your ruling, Your Honor? Because we have no order. We know no ruling. Like, this is, this is hogwash. There was no ruling. He just had a hearing improperly. I will judge whoever, okay? So part and parcel of it is that, that that's why I'm making well, I'm in your affidavit. As a result, I disagree with your characterization that I am. I filed a motion as a result of any ruling. No, no, no. Well, you did in your affidavit. I'm, t I'm, I'm taking in your affidavit as face value, okay? All right? I'm, yes. I'm not contesting where you got the information from, at least not yet. Yes. But... I'm just saying that because it, it also encompasses that I made a ruling. And as a result of that, if I make a ruling and you don't like it, then every, every litigant will say, I want to recuse you, Judge Smith or Judge Glamour or Judge whoever. OK, so part and parcel of it is that, that that's why I'm making my ruling in this particular case. Remember. I think the every <clears throat> the every uh, whatever he's talking about is going to want to recuse him. I think it's more or less every defendant that's ever been convicted by him wants to wants it on appeal because clearly his activities are not necessarily in accordance with proper procedure. And he's the chief judge. Like, can you imagine? Oh my gosh. The appeals court. I think I think the appeals court turned over to the Supreme Court or something. I, I think it's the Supreme Court who has it now. But anyway, whoever's gonna be deciding this case, they have a big job because the second is decided upon and I think it's going to be decided that you know it's improper for his activities to be, be done as they were but if you know if that's not so then that's not so but I kind of feel like he did it and it's not right I mean legally there's like I said there's common sense and the law they are not they're not you know two car lanes apart you know they're the kind of parallel to one another every now and again you wish the law had some more conformity to to some of the liberal um realities of what you may desire but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's far-fetched from from common sense so common sense and the law are typically aligned and common sense gives me the appreciation that <laughs> that uh this is not a good activity for this judge and every case ever decided by this judge is going to come into a problem some years down the line. And 
especially recent cases and, and anything that has to do with these particular ADAs, I mean, all of that is, it really hinders a great deal on the impropriety, the look, the, the visual, the cloud of impropriety. Bias. I've got to do something extrajudicial and I don't. Yeah. Extrajudicial, like witness ADA love in Hilton being in the room, telling the witness, you can lie on the stand and I won't prosecute you just as long as you don't lie about killing Donovan. Because Donovan, you got to say they did it. Yeah. Yeah, that's prejudicial. That's bias. You're, and that's you're a big problem. Particular, like I would have to say something about you or, or, or your clients or anything like that, which I would no. never do because I'm a steward of this picker process. So I understand your what your objection is um, or what your statement is in terms of your motion to recuse. I'm going to deny it. And I believe, Your Honor, that under Rule 25.3, that you have to address, you have to cease acting right now. No, I don't. And then you can, if I can just finish, and then I promise, if I can just finish this. I believe you have to cease acting. I believe that under 25. That's like the, the, the ultimate theme of the judge. No, I don't have to do anything. You can't tell me what to do. I don't care what the courts before said. I don't care what the rule says. I, I, I don't have to do nothing. Well, can I at least tell you what I think? Can I get it on the record? Can I, can I put my record? <laughs> like, he cuts them off. He just does not care what they have to say. You have to look at the Ever. timeliness of the motion. Especially when it's against look him. At the sufficiency of the affidavit. I do not believe that you are committed to just simply deny without taking those steps. Is that it? Yes, it is, Your Honor. Okay. All right. So yeah. no deal. Are you denying at this point? I'm still denying your motion, okay? Will you grant a certificate of immediate review? No, sir. Because no, sir. Okay. So Weinstein's not an idiot. He's not just like asking questions because he just really wants to talk to the judge. He knows the judge is getting ready to say no. The judge already said no. He's making a record. And he's asserting elements that are uh, germane to his argument. And one element is you haven't had full consideration of the motion to recuse. So consequently, you can't just rule not to, you know, can't just rule against and deny. You've got to actually consider it. And there's like, look, I've I seen what you said. I believe you. Okay, deny. <laughs> you don't care. And so, then, or at least that's the impression he gives. And so then he's like, okay, well, you need to have the certificate. And he's like, no. Nope. He's like, but wait, wait, wait. That certificate. It, we're, it, always, we're always talking about how the appellate court. No, because if I grant the certificate, it stops the case, okay? I, I don't agree. And I'm not going to do that. I don't believe it stops the case. I'm not going to do that. And if you, you, you can appeal it at the end of the case. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Hey, I, I'll, I'll, I'll live by it. Okay? Aren't you interested in removing the cloud that's hanging over the case right now, Your Honor? If you Sir, I'd be, I'd be real careful about what you're pleading at this point in time and what you're stating to the court. I just, as a matter of professional responsibility, remember, we haven't nugged out all of the issues involved in that affidavit. And I would be very careful if I were you, because there are, you have some professional responsibility obligations individually and to this court. And so um, I would be, I would just, I would just leave it at that respectfully. I don't want to get into an argument with you about that, but I would just tell you that um, tread lightly, okay, in terms of that at this point. I understand, Your Honor, and, and I believe that the certificate uh, of immediate review would be in the interest of the court. I'm not going to do that. I'm not. Would you I'm make factual that. findings regarding? I'm not. I am not at this point in time going to, um, going to, I've denied the motion. Okay. I believe that's an error, Your Honor. All right. Thank okay. You. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. All right. So. Carl, your presence, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Anything I need to take up before we? Uh, Oh, yeah. Thanks. For, um... Thanks for the long time. Okay, so this is just, <clears throat> this gets into the reminder as to um, where Steele gets into his inquiry. For Mr. Copeland? All right. Mr. Steele, you don't have to if you don't want to. I mean, you know, it's okay. <laughs> I want to. All right, go ahead. <laughs> So we saw like a clip of Steele, right? And it was, he was at the podium and it was just the banter and it was the back and forth. And it was like, wait, what, what, what? And, you know, he's like, hey, it's from the jail. And so the judge has, at this moment in time, the judge has no idea as to what's going on in Mr. Steele's mind right now. And he's like, you don't have to. We, you know, we can go ahead and call the witness because he's just doing housekeeping. Like, is there anything we need to take up before the witness comes out, before the jury comes out? And he's like, well, you don't have to, Mr. Steele. And he's like, yeah, I want to. Well, yeah, I got to do this one. You know, I don't know what is going on. But Elaine, like your mic, I, I swear, press the button and turn the mic on. You said we're going to have a hearing with these lawyers. 
I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't quite hear you talking a little low. I don't know what's going on. As I learned, you said that you'll be hearing this morning with his lawyer. It's been dark since. He's had, oh, okay. Mr. Copeland's had the opportunity to speak with his lawyer, Ms. Ms. Bumpus. And uh, it is my understanding he's going to testify. That's the latest I can give you, okay? So we're going to bring Mr. Copeland out and uh, we'll see what happens. So Mr. Steele's like, chill. He's like, well, I don't know how we got here, Your Honor. We're, we were going to have him testify because he played the fifth. He was supposed to be going to jail. You said we were going to have a hearing. And he's like, yeah, no, the latest I know is um, he's testifying. He's met with his lawyer and he's testifying. You mean he met with you, his lawyer, 13, 12 other people? What did y'all get about? Did the court send the immunity <laughs> order? Um, it should be filed. There's a, it's a, it should they be part of Odyssey. The the time. That's another problem. So the, he... So this witness has immunity and the prosecution was supposed to, or the court or whatever, was supposed to give it to the defense so they know what is in his deal. What, what is his immunity for? You know, is he immune from everything under the sun since he was born or is it the last three years or, you know, what is it? And they don't have it. So that's another thing they don't have. Filed, I think on Friday, so. Out on Friday. Nope. Ms. Love, did you file that already? You mean the, you mean the motion? Okay, so she's saying that the court is the one that has it. We gave it to the court to uh, approve, to sign approval that it's actually filed under seal. Under seal means that it's not available to the general public, but of course. The defense would get it, but not the general public. So when it is filed in the e-file docket system, it just says under seal. There's a motion that says the judge has approved that it's under seal. And consequently, you don't get to see the, um, the contents of it. But that does not mean the defense doesn't get it. And so she was waiting for him to sign the motion under seal in order to serve it upon the defense. That did not happen. He says he doesn't have it. <laughs> okay, Defendants right. don't have it. Um, they want it. They need it. <laughs> So this procedural stuff, like this yeah, happens, well, if you could send them a copy, that'd be fine. Under okay. these circumstances, every, everything they do is like- We're going to need to send them a copy, so we'll send them a copy. Why don't they have it now, though? All right. Um, can I mean, we bring out Mr. Copeland, please? Okay. So we're just going to move on. We're just going to move on. And here, and, okay, so- we're waiting for the witness to come out. I don't know why we zoom in on the judge, but we're waiting for the witness to come out. <clears throat> I believe he comes out and testifies before, uh, yeah, he comes out, he testifies, and then Steele is like, yo, <laughs> dude, we got a problem. <laughs> you got a problem with me? Yeah, I got a problem with you. Oh, this is so interesting. While y'all were in school, did y'all develop a friendship? Nope. At some point in time, did you ever develop a friendship with Shannon? Yeah. So I want you to remember, this is their witness for which they will put their ethical duties uh, on the line for because he is so germane to the factors of, you know, the necessity to prove that these defendants are a gang and doing RICO uh, criminal activity. Now, is he worth this much? Is he really worth it? Because as a juror for me, I'm like, this dude, I don't believe him. And when I do believe him, I don't know if I should believe him. Like, it's so, his testimony, um, give me your opinion. Put it in the chat, give me your opinion. Put it in the comment section. What is your opinion about the witness? Is he worth it? Okay, when was that? Uh, I don't know when, but at one point we became cool. Okay. And when you say cool, what do you mean? C O O L. I didn't actually spell it. I asked you what you mean. I love it. You well, like, I you we became that. cool. I don't know what you mean. I don't know. Like, did you look at him as a brother? Was he an acquaintance? Was he just someone you talked to on occasion? <laughs> when you define cool, what was your relationship like? Oh, cool. just a dude in the street. That's it. We was cool. Did that develop over time? Say that again. You just you said he was just a dude in the street. Did that relationship develop over time? Where he uh, became more than just a dude on the street. I guess. Okay. And when you say, I guess, what do you mean? 
Uh, what you mean? What do I mean? We became cool. Okay. During the course of your coolness with Shannon, did you meet any of his family members? Say that again. As your coolness of your relationship developed, did you meet any family members of his? No. You never met any of his family members? I never met none of his family members. Okay. What about any of his girlfriends? What you mean? Have you ever met any of the people he ever dated? I don't know how he's seen him, but I have seen him with girls. Okay, so you met some of the people that he may or may not have dated. I guess. All right. Now, when y'all were cool and you would see him in the streets, how often would you all hang out with each other? What you mean? How often would the two of you spend time with each other? You gotta be specific. Sure. I um, I'm not too mad at that. It's because, okay, I've lived in a city where you go to the park and folks are there and you're just there and you're happy. It's like family reunion time at, at all time or whatever. And you're just hanging out. You literally are just out and you're, you got your whatevers and you're talking and you're enjoying one another's company. You're laughing. People, maybe you have cards you're playing, you know, whatever. And there's nothing to fear. There's no, no alcohol. There's no drugs. No, nothing. You're just out and about. And so the man is like, yeah, we're cool enough to be out and about with one another yeah he's there and it's like have you ever met any of his girlfriends he's like you know it's not really a defined relationship we're we don't have a defined friendship we're just out you know we live around each other we know each other we don't have a problem with each other we laugh sometimes at each other's jokes we're good somebody was walking with him she was a female there was another female one time i guess that's his girlfriend that could have been his cousin his friend i don't know i'm paying attention we're good and she's just like well um you know, give me more. And it's like, dude, lady, get off of this subject. Would the two of you go out? I go out with anybody, even you. I'm not asking about me. I'm asking about Shannon. Would the two of you go out? We have went out. Okay. How often have the two of you gone out? What does that mean? I don't know. Shannon, his girlfriend? Is it more than, let me see. You said you met him in middle school. Oh. You're 32. So roughly over the course of 20 years. No. guy. No, you have not gone out with him? I met him like in, like, after me and him went to school, we okay. never hung. I met him like in 20, what? I met him in recent years. Like, I didn't, after we left school, like, in school, we didn't knew each other. We didn't. Can you didn't imagine? No. Can you imagine going to like Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles, running into somebody you see like almost every time you go there, and it's like, hey, dude, hey, dude. You may not even know his name all the way. You think it's Kevin, it might be Kel, if you don't know. And you're like, what's well, good? And you sit down with each other and you're just chilling and you're hanging out and it's whatever. Can you imagine this prosecution like turning that into everything this man has ever done in his life? You are connected with it. You're a gang because you guys hang out at Brussels, chicken and waffles every Friday. Home now. So about how old were you when y'all began hanging out with you? You got to thread most, the needle better than our, this. Whatever you're trying to say, I was in jail. So <laughs> prior to you going to jail, did you hang out with Shannon? I say yeah today. Okay. So my question is, if we're in 2024, I want you to think back your earliest memory outside of school when you would first start hanging out with Shannon. Think about jail and Yeah, I knew who he was. You know what's also let me just give you a little other thing that works my nerves about that questioning is I kind of fill him on it. It's if he's in jail for two years and you met him, met this guy ten years ago. And in the beginning, you kind of hung out a little bit. Then you're in jail for two years. You come out, you hang out again another few months. You're back in jail. You're... Why are you? He's like, cumulatively, we've known each other for 90 days, even though it's been over 10 years of time or whatever uh, span of time. It's just we haven't had much connection because I've, if you're in the military, you go off, not, let's say you're not a, a criminal and you're in the military, you have du duty. It's like, I don't no longer associate with you it's not like i'm mad at you and we're no longer friends it's just you know i'm away so when i come back we're cool enough to stay cool but we don't have a much connection and for her to just go on and so on, on a few, point. what you mean you're like oh yeah i've been friends for that's not a full 10-year friendship i will yeah. so did your friendship stop or your coolness because you said coolness did your coolness stop with him when you went to jail Look, he didn't write me in jail. He wasn't putting money on my commissary, okay? So <laughs> he wasn't that cool. <laughs> it's like, come, come now. Well, you know, in jail, out of sight, out of mind. I, in jail, out of sight, out of mind. That's very true. 
when you're not like that's not your boo thing you and not thinking about somebody that's in jail that's not your son i'm hot can i take this sweat off Sure. Why, why, why are you looking at him like that? <laughs> He's like, you want to recess? Well, I didn't take off your sweater. I mean. Can we just, re I'm gonna, we're going to recess, ladies and gentlemen, maybe about five minutes, okay? All right. All rise. We're going to recess to take off the sweater. I don't know. Just I don't know. What, what's the sweater? Because really, the blue shirt just take it off. But okay, maybe the sweater's the undergarment. It's division two. Okay, so we went in recess for him to take off his sweater. Well, guess what? I think recess for him to take off his sweater was a great opportunity in time for, for Brian Steele and crew to find out of nefarious activities before. Because his demeanor on in the witness stand, to me, now, mind you, I'm not criminal. I'm on, I'm on the civil side of life. <laughs> just, I mean, you know, I'm just being funny. But I really just deal with civil cases and, and paperwork. And, you know, so I don't have to deal with much nefarious activity relative to personalities and body language. But I think a behavioral analyst would be great to look at this because he is very much giving off like, F you, I don't want to be bothered. Leave me alone. What are you talking about? Huh? I'm, girl, please. <laughs> You're making much out of nothing. He is a um, not a hostile w w witness because he's answering the questions, but it's like, do you really want these answers? Are these answers helping your case, madam? I, I mean, obviously she feels that there's some value. I think this is when stealing them find out because after this five minute take off my shirt break, we get into still coming to the podium and being like, let's let's have a talk. <laughs> we got a problem. This is still coming to the scene and showing his, his street cred. <laughs> his law cred right now. Um, the way I understand my constitutional obligations pursuant to the 6th and 14th Amendments of the United States Constitution, the corresponding sections of the Georgia Constitution, I'm required to make a full and complete statement to the court. Um, for the record, and if, if, God forbid, this goes up on appeal for the appellate courts or another tribunal, commission, or administrative body, I was told based upon information and belief that when we arrived at 8.30, 9 o'clock today, um, he did not come into your courtroom until almost 11, 11.30. And what I found out just recently, this is not waived, is that um, supposedly in chambers, this honorable court, honorable court reporter at times, honorable court at times, district attorney or district attorneys from the DA's office, as well as investigators, sheriff deputies, Mr. Copeland and his counsel. Wait, 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 wait. Did you see that? Did you see that? Hold on. Look at them. Look at them. Look at these two right here going, wait, 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 wait. Is he talking about the meeting we had under in the in the chambers? Whoa, excuse me. Who told him? Investigators, <laughs> sheriff deputies, Mr. Copeland and his counsel. Uh, met Body together. language tells None so much. The team, to my knowledge, was aware that this was This going is why, on. to be honest with you, this is why I think, even though I figured out this is not in the presence of the jury, of course, because they end up having a break and whatever. But all of this body language between the two, especially um, ADA love, is so expressive. And it's distracting and it's improper in court, when, especially when the jury is there to witness it. Because it can impress upon them to believe or disbelieve something that's going on, and that is prejudicial. So you, you gotta, you always gotta look like, you know, nothing's interesting you, even though it's matting you like inside. <laughs> you gotta keep it inside. But she does not. It do was that told at based all. on information belief that Mr. Copeland was told to the, the district attorneys that Mr. Copeland intended to plead the Fifth Amendment. Then I was told based on information belief that Adrian Love, the lawyer for Mr. Copeland and this court. Um, were together and Miss Love made representations that John Melnick supposedly spoke with some attorneys for the accused and wrote an email to Miss Love, to Adrian Love, um, stating that Mr. Melnick does not represent the witness and that Mr. Melnick wrote an email saying F you and then somehow that email was CC'd to me that never- Mr. Mr. Stu, can I interrupt you for just a second? I'm kind of disturbed because that's ex parte. This All that was an ex parte conversation. Was it now? So that conversation happened in ex party hearing that no one else knew about? Like no one on the defense knew that it was going to happen happened? How did you that find why? out about any of that? Well, I'm a disturbed too. And the reason well, is, I'm asking you a question. And I'm how did you find out about it? I'm going to answer you a question. Okay. Scuttle, if you look at S C U D D E R versus State, which is 298 Georgia, 
438. It's Division 2, 782 Southeast 2. I just want to say something. The very beginning, he's so measured because I think this is my interpretation, my opinion. I think that Ryan Steele is like, there's no way that the chief judge would violate such rights of the defense in such a blatant way. But yet he has this information on good authority. So he's like measured. He's, he's like, you know, very slow. You're like, get it out, get it out, get it out. Because we know he's, the judge is going to stop him from getting it out. At least try anyway. He's very slow and measured. And I think that's because he's like, oh, my God, I'm getting ready to accuse the judge of high imp- imp- impropriety. And he doesn't want to do that. But then he realizes, ah, nah, bro, you don't, you don't deserve this. And then flips. 2016, so our highest court says when a court meets, because Mr. Copeland comes in, meets with the court, the court supposedly made statements, which I assume is somehow what would accurate based upon what you just said. We're entitled, Mr. Williams and every other person wrongly charged here is entitled under the Georgia Constitution to be present. That's well, a critical I, stage. It's, it's just like when you meet with me and you and Mr. Adams meet with me. And I- yeah, this is, that's the point. You see his tonation starts to change, Mr. Uh, Steele, because that's the point that he realizes, oh, no, I got the right information. Heck, oh, my God, this actually happened because the judge is like, that was ex party. He's like, wait, you just admitted this happened? I'm thinking like. Somebody is misunderstanding, and you really Who's just said that this happened. It's, Wait a minute. It's those so he for, starts for a lot of different other reasons, but his tone will, and his I body starts going higher because he gets more and more. Well, I'm going forward. What I was told was that Mr. Copeland said, and you haven't answered my question yet. I'm not. How did you answer that question? You're not. No, I will not answer that. Question. Why will you not answer that question? Because I you know want to deserve sure. it. So, Steele says I want to make sure that the information is correct, but he's now to the position where he's like, oh, you don't deserve it. Because you're going to be retaliatory because you have an issue with power. He has read the, the situation now. It's clicked in his head like, oh, my God, this happened. You really did allow this to happen. You are a problem. Not just it happened, but you are a problem. So, no, I'm not telling you what, who said what. I'm not what I say is I'm not trying no, to no, 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 no. I'm asking anything. you, how did you get this information? I'm not telling the court. What I'm saying is based on information. Okay, well, listen, if you don't tell me how you got this information, then you and I are going to have some problems. We can have as yeah. bad problems right now. Okay, I, like I, I know. I, look, I don't, I don't want to know about your problems, okay, at this point in time. All I'm asking you at this point in time is, how did you come upon this information? You're, look, if the case gets reviewed, the record's going to be available for, 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 for our appellate court and for whatever reason. But it's disturbing that how so, I somehow hate that you process. Observed- I hate, I'm, I'm sorry. I hate that he says that on a frequency because that truly means that you have to go through the whole trial. He has, these individuals collectively had to be found guilty and then you go up on, like, unless you write an amicus brief about it, but it's usually they're found guilty and then it goes up on appeal. That's a lot of resource and a lot of money and a lot of time and it's wasteful. Because like I said before, there, there's another uh, clerk here. There's this lady who I now have confirmed is the court reporter. There are these three um, prosecutors up here. And I think there's like three behind them. Then there's the jurors and however many deputies. Okay. A lot of people getting paid regardless. These people getting paid by taxpayers oh, and the judge get paid by taxpayers money regardless. The defendants who cannot afford defense of their own are getting paid by taxpayer money regardless. I don't know. I don't know. And I don't know. I don't know if that is anybody on this case. But if there were criminal defendants that could not afford counsel on their own, they would be paying. They would um, be getting that defense representation via taxpayer dollars. Then you have who I think Brian Steele is, is a private attorney who's being paid privately through his client. I believe him and another counsel or co-counsel are both being paid directly from Mr. Williams as a defendant. Nonetheless, if you want to burn money, there's two things in life you can do. Buy a horse. You just want to watch money just go, just buy a horse, right? Get a horse. Number two, go to court. These are like the blood sucking money things of life. (laughs) And someone else might, might know some other things. But to me, those are like the top two, because every minute of a trial, every minute of a case is money spent, whether you spend it well or not, that's objective, but it's money spent. Every email you got to pay for every phone call you got to pay for, you know, all the encounters is a money um, opportunity. 
I mean, it's, I'm not objecting to it because I, you know, I like legal. You know, I think legal legal people should get paid. Like, you know, but then there's the attorney who's paying the paralegal, who's paying the assistant, who's paying the receptionist. So the rates are the rates, and you pay for what you you, you get what you pay for. But for this judge to constantly say, "Oh, we'll just take it up on appeal," money is bleeding in this trial. We're ninety plus days. Money is bleeding out. Worse than John O'Keefe was bleeding in the snow. Money is bleeding out in this trial. It is a constant bleed. There is no freezing. There is no stopping. It is a constant bleed out. And it's probably just painfully so, but I wouldn't say it's as painful as Mr. O'Keefe went through because his was a physical pain. And uh, God bless his heart for having to have gone through that experience for whatever caused it, because I'm not convinced. But nevertheless, money is bleeding out in this case. And the judge's remedy is just keep bleeding. Just keep going forward. And then you can appeal it later. Well, guess what? You got to appeal it with more money. Viciously gotten information <laughs> in regards to, to the appeal. court's private ex parte conversation with a party. I mean, a I party, party. Yes. A witness party. who was sworn in Friday. The court's telling, this is what I was told. Right. If it's not true, not true. This court, it's Steele, old, but it's Aspen, Copeland, tell me how, tell me how you got, tell me how you got the information. Let me, let, listen, tell, you want to do tell me how you got me. the information, then we can I'm, go ahead and go forward. I'm not going to say that. What I'm going well, to say is this. I was told, and I hope this concerns the court. It, it concerns told, me that you have proprietary information. Why is it proprietary? information that, that, that you should not be having that was ex parte. Why? With a party. Why? State of Georgia. How about the witness? How about Mr. Copeland, who's supposed so the judge is concerned about who the parrot is, who is the snitch, but yet he's not concerned about the Brady violation that transpired in his chamber. He's more concerned that the information in his chamber kept out of his chamber, but he's not concerned with the ADA's Brady violation. He's not concerned with the ADA accepting unethical witness testimony because the witness has stated that they are a liar and they're going to lie on the stand and they're the killer. And they don't care that the witness has those things to say in his chambers. But he does care that the information that was said in his chambers is a, it has now been availed to the defense. He's more concerned about a snitch than he is the actual legal issues that transpired in his chambers. OK, that's his concern. He announced he's not testifying and he'll sit for two years and then supposedly no, that's this honorable court. OK, or excuse me, let me rephrase that this court supposedly said that's I can right. Hold still, you there's nothing the honorable trial. here. Miss Hilton supposedly said actually all of the defendants and then all 26 people are disposed of. If that's true, what this is, is coercion, witness intimidation, ex parte communications that we have a constitutional right to be present for. So I understand that you're upset towards me, but Mr. I don't know what I did. Mr. Steele, I, I still want to know, should. how did you come upon this information? Who told you? What I want to know is why wasn't I there? So does the mobster get mad that you accuse him of murder or does he get mad that you found out that he murdered someone? This is why I say this is like a judicial mob. The mobster is not mad that you found, he killed someone, okay, yeah, I did that, whatever. But he's mad that you know. Who told you? The snitch. Who told you? Who parroted it? The mobster's not mad that you're saying, oh, well, you're, you were illegal activity by coercion. You were illegal activity by witness intimidation. You had all these illegal activities in ex parte hearing that we weren't aware of. Your own response to being accused of criminal activity, of coercion, um, witness intimidation, and illegal ex parte hearing, your responses who told you not what the heck is wrong with you how dare you accuse the court of coercing one to do anything not when the guy said to relieve a, cl a cloud off of the case he had more of a, res a visceral response to that than he does the fact that he's been accused of illegal activity and criminal activity in his court the court is more upset about you saying that there's a cloud on the case and in the court than then still saying the court has witnessed and participated in illegal in intimidation of the witness and coercion in, ex in any legal ex party hearing. You're more upset about who told them, more upset about there's a cloud on the case than you are about the actual legal activity you're being accused of. There's no visceral response to that. There's no way, Mr. Steele, surely you do not mean to imply that this court is illegal that this court is impugned, that this court is, oh, I don't know, a criminal. We do not call force witnesses. We do not um, collude with counsel anyway. We don't intimidate witnesses. You must uh, govern yourselves 
according to the respect for this court, how dare you suggest or assert such things against this court? No, it's who told you? Who told you? Who told you? Who told you? Yeah. Why, sir? I'm going to hold you in contempt if you don't tell me who this. Oh, I tell me, tell me who this is. You, you go to jail. Well, then, and you won't tell question. me who told you. That's attorney-client privilege information. I am not uh, attorney-client privilege. Unless you were in my chambers, that's I'm, the only way you can figure out. I am. I tell you, you what. I'm going to give you five minutes if you don't tell me. Don't who have to. I'm going to. You don't. You know what would make it attorney-client privilege too? What if one of the witnesses said, "A uh, Mr. Williams, I want you to know X Y Z one two three. This just happened. Something's a problem. This is a this is this ex party." issue is a problem and i want you to understand that you need to talk to your attorneys and let your attorneys know and then the attorneys were like hey, hey, hey come here come here what, what happened that's attorney client privilege that's attorney work product privilege you, you don't the exchange of how the information came about is not really clear however the judge like refuses a whole trial you're supposed to have a hearing tell me who it is i'm gonna put you I'm gonna, no, I'm, we're not gonna I'm do gonna that put you I'm put in you in jail you don't tell me what i want to know that is not attorney client privilege attorney work product privilege i am not how did you me. how did you get that information I supposedly from my chambers did somebody tell you i'm not you should have told me you should have told me you got five minutes well you know, i don't need it i want to continue i don't need what i was told mr copeland says mr copeland made statements that he admitted to killing donovan thomas and was don't take my notes no 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 Boom shakalaka. No, that's way back when, huh? No one knows what that means. But anyway, boom goes. Mr. Steele, before I recess, um, that's the biggie. I asked you, how did you? That's the biggie. However, what I wonder is if that's going to be in the record. Because the biggie is Mr. Steele says, wit sworn witness states in your chambers that he killed Donovan. Will that be in the record? Because before he gets that statement out, the judge goes, we're in recess. And when you're in recess, you're off record. You get this information. Technically. And, 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 and the appellate court, they don't get this. They don't get this video, audio, you know, law and order recording. I mean, what is this? What are they call law and crime. They don't get that. They get the actual transcript. So the motion to recuse was very much necessary because the actual facts and the actual statements are now in the record because of the affidavit that was written. But in this hearing, or in this yeah hearing where he where Steele is trying to put a motion to inquire, which I don't even know if that's a real technical motion, but he's trying to inquire as to this ex party hearing <clears> that it doesn't become a part of the. It is not covered okay, sure. by work product. Mm -hmm. There's only one way you could have gotten him. So I'm I'm going to ask you again. And I respect that. And it gives me no joy. But as, as you know, Georgia rule professional. Oh, he's kind of right. Check I know how you got it. 1.6 comma work 5 fire. reads, and this is what I have. How do you know? 1.6. I know what the, I know what the rule says, but here's the thing. Well, I'm just. But, but, you, but you've got. Answer. But you. But in yes. order. You know, you, interrupt. you need to please tell me who you got it from. I, I'm not asking you the sum and substance of anything as of yet. Okay. But I need you to tell me. I'm not asking sum and substance. I don't want to know the details. I don't want to know on the court record. This is the presentation. Whether this is the intent of this judge or not, who knows? But the reality is, in the in the totality of what we see, it gives the presentation like, he's like, no, 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 no. Don't put this on the record. I don't need it on the record. I just need to know who told you. And that is like a double down of impropriety. That is like, you know, is this the type of tone and is this the type of um, demeanor that you took with the witness? Because this is something that's visible, but the words on the paper, the transcript the court reporter is going to give to the appellate court relative to this hearing, and the transcript of the ex party that they're going to give to the defense relative to the ex party hearing, are just words on the paper. So the body language and the tonation and that like presence that the judge is pressing still with is lost in translation. And I just wonder, is this the same type of um, pressure that you put on Copeland to, to flip him from pleading the fifth into, okay, I'm going to testify. How you got the information. If you don't tell me how you got the information, I'm going to hold you in contempt. I understand. I don't want to be held in contempt. And I don't want to hold you in contempt, but, you, but, but, it, but, it's, but this is so sacrosanct to have a conversation in my chambers parroted to you. You parroted. Word for word. There it is. There's, there's the record that it is word for word. Um, 
that it's accurate information. He is now he is valid. He is given validation to the information. You can have a quiet conversation. You can have a, an NDA. This is what people think a lot about NDAs, that they can't tell what happened. Um, the puffy issue. People think, oh, I don't, I, I'm under NDA. I can't talk about the illegal activities. That's not true. NDAs do not prevent you from talking about things that are illegal because quite actually there's no contract. There's no legal binding contract that will protect illegal activity. It doesn't happen. That's against the law. So let's minimize that to this. Say you got a drug deal. That's a contract. It's a contract. You want to buy some Coke? That's a contract, <laughs> right? You, whatever the key is, you, you get a key, you get $10,000. I don't know what it is. Let's say it's $10,000. I don't know what it costs. But anyway, you got the, the key um, of Coke and the seller of the Coke says, I'm going to sell it to you for $10,000. And you walk in there and you pay them $10,000 and you pick up the key, you take it away and it's baking soda. You cannot go to court and say, we had a contract that he would sell me a key of Coke for $10,000 and he gave me baking soda instead. The court would be like, you did what? <laughs> Come here, we're gonna put you in jail. You just admitted to a crime. <laughs> they are not going to turn around and uh, uphold a contract that is illegal. So when you're having an ex party hearing, you don't have the veil of protection if it is illegal, if you're violating Brady rights in the ex party hearing, guess what? There's no veil of protection anymore. Now the whistleblower can go blow whistles and whistle while they work because you cannot retaliate against them. You cannot get rid of them because you, my dear, turned around and did something illegal that's not protected by the law. I don't care how many cases you bring forth, if you have a Brady violation, in your chambers, your ex party hearing, which was not noticed, didn't give waiver, has all other technical issues, no longer is private and sacrosanct. It's not privileged. And it's others, not, it is that serious. Yeah. No. And that's why I raise it. It is that serious that it we should have been there and shouldn't have happened. <laughs> Sir, that's, 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 a whole, that's a whole separate issue. And this, that, that's, why, that's why ex parte conversations are recorded. Why, why would it be but, ex parte? Be, you like it's ex parte under it's seal. Ex parte. It, no, it's ex parte because that's what the state asked me to do. It's just like when you asked me I've for never, an ex parte conversation. I've never asked this honorable court or any court to meet with me and a witness. Sir. Okay, he went back to honorable court. You're, you're straying off the issue. <laughs> I'm not. I'm the issue to is, the issue is, how did you, who, how did you get this information? I understand the issue. I, I promise you, I understand it. But what I'm trying to ask you is, if <laughs> you're like, I know what you want, but I, know I understand the law. You cannot violate, you can't violate something and then, and then use privilege. Okay? I'm not violating anything. Okay, but that Ooh, is good for the goose, is good for the gander. Hey, Chief Judge Glanville, did you hear yourself? That's why I say motions are good when they're good for you, right? But they also, they also apply to the other side. Did you just hear yourself? You cannot use a privilege, which he's asserting, I think, work part of privilege and trying to, you know, both the rules to that. You cannot use a privilege to hide the fact that you have snuck out information you were not supposed to get. Oh, but you cannot use an ex party uh, privilege of being in the sacrosanct of your chambers to conduct the criminal activity of a Brady violation. That's why I'm saying, how did you get for inf information? But just listen to what I'm trying to tell you. I'm, you're, okay, you're but saying, the, 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 the privilege would occur, the privilege in 1.6 would occur if you, if you were in the right place, right time to begin with. You weren't, but let me tell you, I'm just reading from you know? it, but if I'm reading it wrong, I'm not trying to. It says 1.6 applies not. That's where um, the Ashley merchant comes in and says, you have accused my client Ben Steele of a criminal activity. This judge has asserted on now more than one occasion where he, in her encounter, says, no, no, I don't think he did. I'm just saying there's very limited ways for him to come by this information. But that's why Ashley says, well, we need to have a full hearing on it then. So we can find out witness to witness who did what, where, when, and we can have a conclusion, not just, you know, assertions and allegations, because you're alleging, Your Honor, that he has criminally done wrongdoing which is, you know, either, I guess, steal some information, you know, some records, or what he does say he asserted was that uh, Ben Steele was somehow listening at the door. And so he's like, you you've come across this information because you were improper. 
because what he, Ben still says is I am trying to insert work product privilege. And he's saying, well, the only way that privilege applies is if you were in the right place at the right time and you were not. How, how do you come to such a conclusion that he was not? He's like, you were at the door listening. I, you know, that's the assertion that he's putting forth. Merely and still. to what matters is communicated in confidence by the client, but also to all information gained in the professional relationship, whatever its source. So you're asking me to break your order. This rule 1.6, I did not find written the way Ben reads it off. I'm interested in that because the language that he gives is so important. Um, let me see if I take this back. It's not just mm, conversations with your client, but the work product is, is um, covered no matter the source. So you don't have to give up the source. Confidence by the client. But all okay, so here, let's listen to from it. But if I'm reading it wrong, I'm not trying to. It says 1.6 applies not merely to matters communicated in confidence by the client, but also to all information gained in the professional relationship, whatever its source. So you're- All information gained in a professional relationship. So guess what? That also covers. Consider having a defense attorney who has a defense investigator. If the investigator goes out and finds out new information, that's work product privilege. That's covered. So I don't think he's, now that I listen to him a little more carefully, I don't think he's actually reading rule 1.6. I think he's reading a judge's um, interpretation of it. Maybe a case law. So maybe that's why I don't find his. Parte under it's ex parte. It, no, it's ex parte because that's what the state asked me to do. It's just like when you asked me I've for never, an ex parte conversation. I've never I'm asked this on court or any court to meet with I me in a week. Case. Sir, tell, Supreme, you're, you're straying off the case. issue. I'm not. I'm the issue to. is the issue is how did you who how did you get this information? I understand the issue. I, I promise you, I understand it. But what I'm trying to ask you is, if you look at comment five, this is how I understand the law. You cannot. Uh, vi you can't violate something and then and then use privilege. Okay? I'm not violating anything. Okay, but okay. that's why I'm saying, how did you get the inf information? But just listen to what I'm trying to tell you. I'm, you're, okay, you're but saying, see, the, you're with the contempt, privilege would occur. It. The privilege in 1.6 well, would occur. let them do that behind us. If you, we'll if you were in something. the right place, right time to begin with, you weren't. But let me tell you. I'm just reading from it, but if I'm reading it wrong, I'm not trying to. It says 1.6 applies not merely to matters communicated in confidence by the client, but also to all information gained in the professional relationship, whatever its source. So you're asking me to break, you're ordering me, maybe, you're asking me, you're, I'm not saying you're ordering, but to give you information and you're saying it's not some substance, but I'm telling you, I can't do that under the bar rule. All right, well, I'm going to hold you in contempt. And um, okay. you can you can think about okay. it. Five o'clock today. All right. We'll see, we'll see All right. where we are found, at that point. Because no, that's well, not what I found. I, I found. I found. I, okay. So I figured out what he is quoting. He's quoting the comments number five. So because the judge speaks over him and cuts him off so much, it makes it really hard to glean exactly what Ben Steele was saying because um, Georgia rule. Professional conduct 1.6 is what he's quoting. Um, and the rule is here. It's all of this here, right? I said, okay, okay, okay. Well, in here, the maximum, these, these are comments. These are comments to the rule. This is like rule of ethics is what comes up in a legal standard for those who are associated with the organization. So real estate has ethical rules. If you are associated, uh, first of all, you have ethical rules under your license. Your license in California is under business and professions code. And so all ethical rules there you're bound by. But then if you sign up for an association and I'm not gonna start promoting which ones, but there's a few of them, they have ethical rules that you're bound by. In addition to your legal ethical rules or your legal requirements. Your, and liabilities. So as an attorney, you're bound by your, your, your rules of law that, that govern you, as well as your ethical rules that will come from your bar. So Georgia has their professional conduct rule here, and it's amended as of April 25th, 2024. So the judge who's like, we are going through the law, we're cleaning it up, and we're making it more current. This is a pretty current, pretty current, um, thing right so i oh, don't don't stick on me now don't do that okay there we go um so overall rule itself is a lawyer should maintain confidence in all information gained in the professional relationship with a client 
And so that's where the digital is like, yeah, but this is this is the information you, that your client gave you, and your client could have given you this. Your client was not in the room, okay? So don't give me um, don't give me that. But it says including information which the client has requested to be held um, in violate. Oh, in, vi in violation. Okay, to be held in violent or disclosure of which would be embarrassing or would likely be determinal detrimental to the client. So say that the client says, yeah, I did kill him. You, he can't tell the judge, my client says he did kill him. Unless the client says, yeah, you can tell him, you know, he has to release the right. That's the basis of that. Unless the client gives informed consent. Okay, there you go, that's what that is. Except for disclosures that are Im um, impliedly authorized in order to carry out the representation or are required by these rules or other law or by the order of the court. So the court's like, I'm ordering you to tell me. So you have to tell me. Okay. So a lawyer may reveal information covered by this paragraph A, which the lawyer reasonably believes is necessary to avoid or prevent harm or substantial financial loss to another as a result of the client's criminal conduct or third party criminal conduct. So in violation of the law. So consequently, if the client says, yes, I did kill him, the attorney does not have to tell. He actually has the duty to keep it to himself unless the client says he wants that um, information disposed of. But if the client says, I'm going to kill the witness, that's a problem. He has an ethical duty to tell now because you're talking about, I am going to kill. So if you remember, um, who was the one? Samuel Jackson and uh, Matthew McConaughey's movie, um, A Time to Kill. He walks in and he gives the implication like, hey, what would you do? And he's like, yeah, I would kill. I, I would lose my mind. He kind of feels guilty about that later. That's not, it's kind of like, mm, he was supposed to call. He, he, as the attorney who got some information or some kind of inclination that Samuel Jackson's character was getting ready to uh, go after these guys who have, uh, you know, essayed his daughter. He's got to call the sheriff and be like, hey, yo, <laughs> I kind of think this might go down. Not sure, but uh, he kind of said a thing or two and I'm feeling a kind of way. And that's the responsibility because whether it's the, his client or a third party, clearly in violation of the law. That's where privilege is, is no longer um, applied. To prevent serious injury or death, and even if that's to his self, to the client's self, and self if the client says, I'm gonna kill myself, well then you, you, have to, you have to tell on that too, you know, to help keep your client preserved. Okay, to establish a claim of, okay. To establish a claim of defense on behalf of the lawyer, the controversy between the lawyer and the client, that to establish a defense to a criminal charge or a civil claim against the lawyer based upon conduct in which the client was involved, or to respond to allegations in any proceeding concerning the lawyer's representation of the client. So if, like, Copeland is like, the lady who's representing me is having an affair with the, the other guy, so I don't want her to represent me, then the, um, that attorney can break privilege to, to speak legally uh, in defense, okay? So that's when they can speak in defense of themselves or, you know, just speak to the representation. Like, I wasn't, rep like, she could say something, well, my relationship with the DA happened long before we were actually represent representing this client, you know, it has nothing to do with that client, something like that, you know, under that circumstance. This is clearly good advice about the lawyer's comp compliance with these rules. So therefore that can be broken under such time to detect, resolve conflicts of interest arising from the lawyer's change of employment. So if the lawyer changes from one firm or to another, then you may have to disclose as an attorney some privilege just to determine if you have a conflict of interest at the new firm because some other lawyer represented uh, a different defendant at a certain time. And a situation described, if the client has acted at the time the lawyer learns of the threat of harm or loss or to a victim, use or disclosure is permissible only if the harm or loss has not yet occurred. Right. So you can disclose it as long as the harm or the loss has not yet occurred. So if he's done something in the past, you cannot disclose it. It's already done. It's just reaffirming that before using or disclosing information pursuant. If feasible, the lawyer must make a good faith effort to persuade the client either not to act or if the client has already acted to warn the victim. So, you know, if the client is going to put a hit out on someone, you you're like, as the attorney, you have to make this effort to, you know, get the client not to act. Don't do that. Don't put a hit on them. And then you find out, well, it's done already. So now the victim gets to get warned. That's when you call the sheriff. Sheriff, go or, you know, whatever. Go, um, go protect this victim because I think my client has put a hit out on them. All right. And that's okay. Because even though it's client privileged information, uh, attorney client privilege, that privilege is lost because you have to protect this victim. You can't allow the client to admit to doing, getting ready to do wrongdoing. You're there to protect them from the things they've done already. 
and to make sure that their rights are preserved, but you're not there to allow them to continuously be uh, a criminal or maybe they're not a criminal. And so you're protecting them from that, but you're not allowing, you're not protecting them for future criminal duty or activity. The duty of confidentiality shall continue after the client lawyer relationship has terminated. So they're no longer your client. You still can't tell nobody. Maximum penalty is disbarment. You can be disbarred from, that's why I say when a, when a attorney is telling um, things on a penalty of perjury, when an attorney is, uh, in this case, if an attorney was breaking client privilege, disbarment, meaning they no longer can be an attorney. They can't work in their line of work. So they can't, you know, try cases. They're disbarred. Comment section is where um, Ben is citing from. And he's in number five and he starts off here. This is where he gets into. Rule 1.6, the one we just read, applies not merely to matters communicated in confidence by the client. So it's not just the communication that the client sets, but it's also to all the information gained in the professional relationship, whatever its source. So this is to say, this is how you apply this rule. All these different ways um, is how the rule is applied. And this is most updated this year in April. So Ben is reading that. A lawyer may not disclose such information except as authorized and required by the rules of professional conduct or other law. See also scope, um, which would also give reason to all these provision, provisional reasons that were here as to why a lawyer would, um, oh, come on, come on, it doesn't like going down, why a lawyer would be um, able to disclose privileged information. The requirement of maintaining confidentiality and information gained in the professional relationship applies to government lawyers who may disagree with the client's policy goals <laughs> like it just it applies to everybody you don't get out of it um and it goes into different comments so the comments are very extensive and they're but they're highlighted by based on um based on category but that i finally figured out what ben was talking about good job ben thank you appreciate understand it. the rule to be I've, I've not asked you some in substance of what was said i asked you how you got it you can't do that yes you I, can because i no. have an idea how you got it well your idea i have an idea wrong. how you got it but that's improper sir. your idea may be wrong and your idea you may to, be wrong listen i told you the first time and I'm not sure. I don't want to. I don't want to hold you in contempt. But it, this is that serious, Judge. You I'm cannot ease. You cannot eavesdrop and get get information that was not not meant for you to hear at that particular point in time. So there's the criminal. There's the criminality once again stated. You cannot eavesdrop, get information, and now claim privilege because how you got this information was improper. You were not in the right place at the at the right time. So you don't get to imply privilege. Judge, you, listen. You're calling and Ben a criminal. I'll do whatever you want. Against his ethical duty. To five o'clock or after. You know. But what I'm trying to tell okay. you is, Your Honor, this is so serious to me. We need a hearing. I'm moving for a mistrial. It is my understanding based upon information belief. from And um, Ben is stating, when he says this is so serious to me, I'm moving for a mistrial. Ben is stating, I'm going to die on this sword. Because this is so serious. He's trying to say, your honor, I'm willing to put my license, my practice, my ability to live and provide for my family on the line because this is very serious. We need a full hearing. This is improper. And the judge is like, whatever, kid. Who did it? Part of it. From whom? Well, I'd like to get the substance first and then I then we can Okay, talk well, then, you, then you'll be in custody until then because well, then I, then. because because you need to tell me how you got the information. I'm not asking you what was said. You've already kind of given us some snippets of what you said. That tells me that somebody parroted that information to you. So, but you're assuming something because I told you already. Well, then, I other than if, if you were if you were sitting, client. unless you were sitting in there with a recorder or Miss Love or Miss Hilton uh, or one of the deputies gave you that information or Miss Weaver shot you a rough copy of the transcript, there's only one other person's left. Well, Your Honor. And and if that person gave you that information. You know who's left? You know who's left? Copeland's attorney. He listed everybody who was there because he knows they won't tell. Those are his people. They are true to him. ADA, prosecution, his court reporter, Miss Weaver, the deputies, and who is left? Copeland attorney but oddly enough he doesn't account copeland what if copeland told because ben is saying you know i got it through my client 
I can't tell you what my client told me. I got information from a client. I can't tell you what my client told me. And I can't tell you information I, I gained after that. Like, I can't tell you source of information. Like, this is client privilege. It, it goes beyond just what my client told me. And that's why I think, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. But it, it would not be too far-fetched that Copeland's like, I told them people I killed them. And they still was like, whatever. They made me sit up in the room and, and talk to the judge. And, and then uh, Williams goes, hey, Ben, Copeland's like, yo, they had him in a room talking to the judge. And he told him he was going to tell him. If he killed Donovan, what are you talking about? That's why we sitting here this long. Because first of all, you're sitting in a courtroom for two, two hours, two and a half hours. You think folks ain't trying to figure out why? <laughs> why are we about? What happened? What are we doing? <laughs> or a friend of Copeland's told Jeffrey, hey, yeah, they had him up in this room with the judge during break, mind you, because they had a break. Because he's like, I need to take my jacket off. I'm hot. Maybe that's when it happened. And so we don't necessarily know all of the chain of this information. Because at that point, Ben could have turned around and said, hey, Copeland attorney. And Weinstein could have came over. And Ben could have been like, I just heard from a client that y'all just had a meeting. Yeah, child, we had a meeting. Let me tell you what happened. They did this. Still client privilege. It's still client privilege because that's where the privilege lies. You can get information from your client directly. You can get information um, on behalf of your client from someone else, or you can investigate information and determine stuff that, you know, professionally you find out you don't have to disclose. The court doesn't get to know. Or share that information with you. She probably violated privilege. Well, let me, let me tell you two things. She probably violated privilege. So this is where the judge confirms that he believes that the person who told is not Copeland, he believes it's Copeland's attorney. It feels like that Copeland's attorney violated Copeland's privilege by restating what Copeland said by saying that he was the um, murderer of Donovan. So that's where he is. That's how he is deductively reasoning that it was. One, I don't know, don't know how that is a privileged communication. It shouldn't have well, been. Well, it's because she has a client she's supposed to represent. It couldn't be. A, she has a client to, she has, she has a client to represent. Right? But how is it a privileged communication if it's ex parte in front of all these other people? <laughs> Who are you talking? But anyways, I, I'm, I'm not going to have. Like, I got this information. <laughs> I'm not going to have any further conversation well, with you about this. I want to know. The question still ah, remains. I, I want to know Tell how. Who gave you the information? I'd like to know what information happened outside of presence. That's right. really it. You, you can go into custody at this point. I think that the court needs to again declare a mistrial based upon. Okay, and I'm going to deny. Your mo- I'm going to deny your motion. I'm going to deny your motion. I understand that you spoke with the when, witness outside of our presence. And whenever, week. yes, I, I, I had an ex parte conversation, and, and, which is a, which is you, appropriate. And you influenced the witness based on information oh. belief, and I'd like to have that all on the record. All right. I mean, I don't know why that's so hard to do. If nothing okay. happened bad, that's fine. But you're right. acting like tell me who it is and don't talk about the substance. Why can't why can't we have an issue? That was outside of presence. It should not have been because you got some information that you shouldn't have gotten. Um, why? Well, we can. That's that. That's for another day. But why? Okay? why that's for we another day. In the first place, I didn't know about this. So that's for another day. So I raised it as soon as we found out about it. Well, I gave you the case I'm relying on. I assume you read it. If you didn't read it, you should read it. It's a material part, a critical part of the case. When a judge speaks with a witness outside the presence of the accused, the court has said it's right there in Division I, Two. Okay. That is a material or critical part of the case, and it's an automatic Deal. reversal. So this law, this legal assertion that Ben is now putting on the court's record, and these two attorneys are flopping their heads left and right because they just refuse to accept reality, along with the judge, is division two. And he's saying the motion to recuse, you need to review this, that if you have communication that is critical to the trial outside of the presence of the defense, it is an automatic uh, recusal, I think is what he said. And so what that means is you've got to figure out if the information that you had in X party was critical, was critical to uh, Ben and Weinstein's thought. It's critical because it's information that says that Copeland says he's the actual murderer. Um, but yet the judge is like, no, we're not going to have that hearing because we're going to keep going on with this case. You're not going to slow this case down. And Ben is like, wait, 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 we're not trying to slow the case down. The case has a problem because we have automatic recusal issues. You need to deal with division two. We need to have a full hearing on it to find out substantively if this information is truly accurate. If this is exactly what he said or if the person who has told us this misunderstood or misheard, we need to ensure that this is actual and true. Guess what, your honor? 
just like any other defendant, we have trials and we find out. Is it true? We don't just say, hey, you did criminal activity. These are allegations that need to be investigated and determined true or not. Of course, he doesn't want to hear it. Of course, they don't want to hear it. They're like, whatever. No, no, no. But this is why I'm like, how do you think this trial really is going to end? And how do you think you're doing the best by your citizens by allowing this to continue when you know you have all of these mistrial and, and recusal issues? Mr. Steele, but you're acting like it's Mr. Steele. That is. He says, you're acting like this is proprietary. It's not proprietary information. We're not trying to trademark a thing here, Your Honor. Part of the case. When a judge speaks with a witness outside the presence of the accused, the court has said it's right there in Division I, 2. Okay. That is a material or critical part of the case. And it's an automatic Steel. reversal, Mr. Steele. Oh, automatic reversal. Like so this is an appellate um, decision. Division 2, automatic reversal. Oh, I thought it was automatic recusal. No. Oh, he's saying, Your Honor, you are, you are killing the case in real time. This is what uh, Ben is saying based upon the case part a critical part of the case when a judge speaks with a witness outside the presence of the accused the court has said it's right there in division I, two okay. that is a material or critical part of the case and it's an automatic Steel, reversal mr Steele. but you're acting like it's mr Steele. that is not when when that is not the case when somebody discloses information in a ex parte conversation oh he said, that's not the case when someone... Okay, so the judge's defense to that is Division 2. Let's see if we can find it. Let's see if we can find it. Oh, Georgia. Division 2. Let's see. What was... Um, judge speaks to witness outside of accused. Um, exclusion of witnesses. Witness suppression rule derived under the influence of the case. Um, I don't know if it's rule two. He's called a division two, but it might be rule 5.2. Uh, let's see, what does it say? Ex party orders under compelling circumstances and motion for temporary limitation of access not to exceed 30 days may be granted ex party upon motion accompanied by supporting affidavit. Okay, that's how you get ex parties. That's not necessarily of interest. All you Walker appellant. Was this, was this division two aggravated assault for Judge Burrow? Um, I'll have to look a little further. If I find it, I'll put it in the um in the description because I just don't want to go down a rabbit hole. Let's see what this says. It's not you're not really excluding a witness. A party who is an actual person. Article dancing with this one. I see. I have to, I think if I find his motion for recusal, I'll probably find it there. Because this is sequestering the witness, meaning keeping the witness from the outside world because they're still testifying. Okay, so sequestering does not prohibit discussions between the attorney for the party. Perspective witness. So as long as the attorney talks to the witness separately from any other witnesses, okay. Lectures not include victim witness violation of the slayer question. Hearing violation. Finish testifying ritual observation. I quote the following testimony not presidential. <clears throat>
That is a very long code, isn't it? I don't know the exceptions. Okay, Ben, I'm gonna need to read your your motion. I'm sorry, guys. Um, let's see. I just know if I look up judge, of course, <laughs> it's gonna be like part of the. I've been serving a court order that court erred in declaring this child due to violation. Denial of a plea in bar, which asserted double jeopardy grounds after the first trial, defendant ended with the trial judge's uh, sua sponte declaration of a mistrial due to violation of the right of sequestration was absolute, subject only to the discretion of the trial judge in making exceptions thereto. Okay, so that might go to the defense towards the attorney, I mean, towards the judge. He might be able to do, use Johnson versus State. The right of sequestering was absolute, subject only to the discretion of the trial judge. So the ex party hearing, which is what he's um, trying to assert right now, is that the ex party hearing has covering that allows the judge to make exceptions. Okay, but I don't think making the exception to have the ex party hearing is the biggest problem as I remain. I think the biggest problem is the Brady violations that this, this witness has stated, I will lie on the stand. So what? Um, I'm going to say that I'm the murderer. Okay, now we're going to do something about that. Those type of things are much more of issue. So if that's proven to be true, I think that's the bigger issue relative to the ex party, though notice should have been given that may be just a finding but i don't think that that's like the mistrial element i think the mistrial element or the um thing that the appellate court will use on reversal if if it goes that far is the fact that if it's found that copeland admits to the murder so you can't have someone admitting to murder don't turn that over to the defense defense not allowed to put that before the jury and then turn around and find the defense guilty for murdering the person that someone else said they did you know that's that's brady violation Okay, um, but it's a discussion of the trial judge, okay, who may make exceptions. So Welsh agrees too that the trial judge can make exceptions. So there we go. We got that going on. It was the trial judge to grant security. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to, aside from some exception rules that the judge can permit, the trial judge has the right to permit, which is what the judge is saying. So kudos, judge got that right. You know, he's a judge for a reason. Aside from that, I'm not following or finding the division to automatic reversal. So let me see if I can find automatic. An expert is not automatically accepted. Okay. Yeah. So automatic, um, you say, yeah, reversal. So let's see. So I'm just not in the right place or wherever. Um, Counsel reference in presence of such sequestered witness in state criminal trial to testimony of another witness as grounds for mistrial reversal. Okay, these are the references. Okay, we'll see if that makes any difference. Let's get back into court. Let's just go to court and just get done with it, right? We've seen it so many times. But seeing it again allows us to see it from a different angle with different information, with more understanding, less understanding, whatever, more, more questions, so forth and so on. And guess what? As a juror, they don't get to see any of this because this is outside of the presence of the jury. But as a juror, when you're looking at Copeland testify, you're like, huh? <laughs> and you only get to see it once. We get to go back and read. That, the, and that research. The one all the same lawfully time. asked me to hold. You're not supposed to have communication with a witness who's all been right. sworn. You know, that, I'm, not, I'm not telling you. I'm just saying if you read the case, I'm assuming you read it. That's what it says. And and you did it. The state wish to be heard. You, say, you said it supposedly. Yes, yeah. And what I'm trying to get to is why does that happen outside of presence? And I need to have the I'm res respect requesting the transcript that you mentioned to be given to us so we could really understand it. And then anything that was not on the transcript, if anything, that we understand what happened outside our presence. Okay. And now you, you have put it where somehow I have to reveal. And I told you, I told you the first time I'd be breaching 1.6. And I know you're assuming something. I don't think you're breaching 1.6. You can't hide behind 1.6. I'm not hiding no, behind I think you will be. But the thing is, I think you got this Comment number five. Um, somebody disclosed it to you. And that's the only way you could have gotten it. Well, what I got. Because, unless I got. you're sitting there. 
unless you're sitting there and you're eavesdropping. So, so you can't use something ordinarily that you had no, no business getting to begin with and then stand on, well, hey, we didn't give you the information or that the, a party didn't give you the information. So, Your Honor, but that's the issue, isn't it? Well, Why aren't we well I'll, 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 you know, that's, that's, the, that, that, leads, the that, leads to be, that leads to be told. But, but, they, but right, right now, now, we don't. The honor, so the judge is right. It, it leads to be told, meaning that we need to have a full hearing and discover and go through findings of facts. Right now, there's a lot of allegations, assumptions, things being thrown in the air. But the problem is, as he's saying at one point, that leaves to be discovered. That's what they're asking for. That's what Ben is saying. We need to have this hearing so we can discover the facts. We can have a finding of fact. And he's like, no, we're not gonna have a finding of fact. We're not gonna do a, a trial in a trial. We're not gonna try this particular issue. We're gonna move forward with the main trial. We'll find that out later after everybody's memory is, is dull, like that's problematic, but obviously they have a, um, a transcript. Hopefully that is going to be draft form rough. I mean, like, give me the rough. I do not want the clean version. I want full rough. No, Mr. <laughs> why we weren't, we were excluded from that. Mr. Steele, and I want that if stop, Mr. Just stop. Williams constitutional right. Mr. Stop. Georgia constitution. Just stop at this point in time because article one, because you, did, you already said that you've already Mr. said Georgia that. constitution and we had a right to be present. All right, Mr. We're not waiving anything. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Love? And Your Honor, excuse me. Um, and I know I said this previously. Yes, sir. But we are not accepting any proffer oh, from this. Okay. Law. Excuse me. Okay. All right. Yes, ma'am. Your Honor, I um, am disturbed uh, yeah. by. I don't care what she has to say. I don't. I'm sorry. Person, you can go back and watch it if you care. I don't. Uh, no, no disrespect to her as an individual and her education and, and abilities. I just, I just didn't find the necessity. To, I mean, you know, the judge needs to hear from both sides. Obviously, I just find that her side is already tainted because she's a part of the the, the inquiry. So, I don't want to listen to it again. I heard it. She basically says, "We believe you. You're right. You're right." They have no right to nothing. Defense, defendants don't get rights. Regarding further appropriate remedies. Oh, please shut up. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> sure. And Your Honor, also, unless it's Mr. Adams representing Mr. Steele in the capacity as someone who has been held in contempt, Mr. Steele just argued whatever it is that they are trying to argue based on information we believe illegally obtained mr okay from the okay so now in addition to the court's allegation of illegal um activity criminality the uh prosecution is saying you we also believe it's illegal that uh still has come across this information under illegal means um whatever they may be so that's where it's criminal contempt. And then she doesn't want to hear from this other attorney unless he's going to be representing in the um, criminal contempt um, order that they're requesting against Steele. So that's the basis of what just happened. And he's like, nah, bruh, I don't represent oh, him. I represent my client. As I have appeared before this court many a times for the last 90 some odd days. Don't be confused. <laughs> I represent Mr. Williams. And my that's what that means right there. Let's get it clear, lady. No, I represent my client, Mr. Williams, who I've been representing for 90 some odd days. This is this is what that whole statement is. And that whole posture, that one arm and that back, that back lean right there is like, bro, you know better. Tamed. <laughs> Mr. Okay. From the court's chambers. Oh, I posture. represent Mr. Williams. And my statements are in regards to my representation of Mr. Williams. Clearly. Um, he has two attorneys. Okay. Yeah, he Clearly. does. But the court now having found Mr. Steele in uh, contempt, if the court continues in, in, in that position, uh, that leaves Mr. Williams represented, at least at this juncture, by myself. Um, that puts me in a position of, of making sure the court is aware that I'm in receipt of the same information uh, that Mr. Steele received. I'm of the same opinion uh, that the court is in. Check this out. Check this out. This is the double down of all double downs. You have been still like, look, there's a problem. I got information. You wrong. Your honor. We need to figure this out. Let's have a hearing. Judge is like, nope. Who told you? We're not having a hearing. Tell me who told you. That's all that needs to be said at this time. He still is like, no, I'm not telling you who told me. I'm telling you we need to have a hearing to find out if these facts are true. Find out if this is factual, if this information is actually true. Because it 
affects a critical concern. It's critically materially effective to my client's defense. It is critical to this case. We need to have a hearing. Are these facts true? Don't want to hear it, not listening. So you're in contempt. Contempt, putting him in contempt puts him in jail, puts him incapable of being at trial, but you know, it does things. So the second attorney is saying, well, guess what? I have the same issues. I know the same facts. I got the same problem and I'm not telling you either. And do you think the judge puts him in contempt? Engaged uh, in behavior that uh, I believe compromises uh, the continuation of this trial. I do believe that we are um, entitled to and should receive a copy of the transcript so that a full investigation can be made as to what we believe has occurred here. Um, and so I take the same position as Mr. Steele. Um, I am asking for a mistrial, um, as he did previously, and I'm telling the court that uh, we, I do not believe that we can proceed at this point based upon the information that we've received. All right, so and, and, I, and frankly, I, I don't believe the state has any say in, in that. My statements are in regards to my representation of Mr. Williams, and if Mr. Steele is going to be held in contempt, uh, I have exactly the same position. Um, I, I also do not. Well, believe I asked. That. I asked him, so I didn't ask you. Yeah. So, but um, I'm. I'm. Uh, I'll leave it at that. So, look at the slyness of this. Attorney's like, "Hey, yo, I got the same issue. If he's in contempt." What say you, Your Honor? And the judge says, well, I asked him. I didn't ask you. He's in contempt because I asked him. I didn't ask you. But now this, this attorney represents, I have the same information from the same source as Mr. Steele. And the judge does not ask him because the judge does not want to put him in contempt because the judge does not want the defendant to be without representation because that would slow down the trial. Anything that would slow down the trial, the judge will not do. He will not investigate the impropriety of this ex parte. He won't have you know, another judge do that. He doesn't want to have a hearing to figure out if the facts that were uh, certainly asserted within the mistrial um, motion are in fact true and correct based on the transcript that this gentleman has you know, um, stated that he's actually the one who has committed the murder. He don't want to find that out. Anything that's going to slow down the trial, he's not interested in. Now, I get this. It's 90 some odd days. Obviously, it's a lot, right? That's a lot for a trial. It's a lot of resource. It's a lot of time to put a pause, a stop, or, or you know, come to mistrial. However, the information is actually extreme. It's not just, I don't want to testify. It's, I'm going to lie if I testify. It's, I'm the one who murdered the guy, not them. So it's major pieces of information that's a problem. And he's like, no, I'm not going to find you. I'm not going to find you in contempt because I didn't ask you nothing. I ain't got nothing to ask you. You can go ahead and sit down because you're going to represent okay. the client. And that's where What's in the motion Shirley? when they say inconsistent ruling, this is the inconsistent Honor, ruling. As you know, I represent Shannon Stillwell. On this behalf of Shannon up. Stillwell. Every defendant is like, hey, we moved too. First hey, foremost, we know this too. Um, I just want to clear up a few things that have been said. Um, today, we were instructed to come 8.30 for a 9 o'clock start. I would not be honest with the okay. court if I said I was here at 8.30, but I was probably here at about 8.40. Mm -hmm. um, we did not start till approximately, I'm, I'm estimating, 11 o'clock. Um, clearly, um, we figured something was going on. We were given right. no information about any meeting, nothing. who was meeting, so. what the meeting was about, or whether the meeting Please. was ex parte. Listen, law and common sense. Let's put our common sense head on for a minute. You're sitting in a meeting that's supposed to start at nine. Listen, I have meetings that's supposed to start at nine. At 9.05, people are like, okay, so we're, we're going to start. Like they're losing their mind. I'm like, wait, wait, wait. Let's give people just a minute, you know, 9.05, and then we'll actually start. Imagine your meeting is supposed to start with the court, who's very timely under most circumstances, at 9 a.m. There's sometimes when maybe the court reporter is stuck in traffic or something has happened that delays it for maybe 30 minutes to an hour. This is not ab abnormal. Because issues happen. Life is life. But you are an attorney. You are a person. You are a witness. You are a defendant. And you're sitting there at 9 o'clock, 8.30, 8.45, because you know you got to be there earlier for the 9 a.m. You're supposed to start at 9 a.m. And you're like, looking at the deputies like, yo, can we go inside the court? We're supposed to be in court at 9. It's 9.15. No, the judge is not ready yet. Uh, okay. 9.30. Hey. Can we at least set up though? Can we at least like just sit like comfortably with our stuff out? Uh, okay, whatever. 
10 o'clock. You're looking at your, you're looking at your co-counsel. So you're like, what's going on? And then you look at the other defense. You know what's going on? It's 1030. It's 1015. It's 1030. It's 1045. 11 o'clock, the judge comes out and you're like, okay. And the judge is like, okay, anything else we can talk about? Where you're like, no. And just like, okay, so we're going to have Copeland testify. Wait, 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 what? <laughs> what? That is a normal response. Okay. That's we're not ex parte. Who requested the meeting? Who was in the meeting? We were completely in the dark. In the dark. And quite frankly, we kind of remain in the dark. Yep. Um, we ask and you don't answer. I am not a false accuser. Okay. I do not just willy nilly accuse people of things. So. Which you can hear his reserve too. And that was Ben's original tone. He was very reserved and measured. He was like, oh my God. He, he was almost like, am I really saying what I'm saying? Until the judge is like, yeah, how did you know that? And he's like, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. So I'm right? Like, why do I know this? Why is this the case? I'm not going to throw out yeah. spurious allegations. Not like the ones me. that have been thrown at me over the past couple of days. I don't know what those are. are. absurd. But I will say, Your Honor, what I do know is just based on what we've heard over the last 20 minutes, it appears there was a meeting um, that I know knew nothing about that involved Your Honor, the district attorneys, um, and a witness who had been sworn in. My client was not given an opportunity to be present at this critical stage. This was a critical stage in this trial. That error is a foundational structural error in this case, and it is the cause for an immediate mistrial. Additionally, Your Honor, I believe he is quoting the the authority. He made the point. This is an error. This is a mistrial action. And he's quoting the authority. I just don't know the case or the, the law that he's quoting, but Ben said it was division two. If I find it, I'll put it in. But that's his quotation. It is foundationally of, of issue because it's so critical. And it so is. If that's the words that he said, it so is. Why not investigate it? Why not let this be investigated? That this meeting, again, I, I'm going to ask for the transcript. And I'm going to ask for the recordings as well. Should I'm they exist? Altered. But I believe that this may have also this meeting with a witness without us present may have made the district attorneys and or your honor a witness right to this in this case right oh and see that face see that oh, 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 oh. her and her expressions challenge they they get her in trouble being with a witness <laughs> with without the public us present i mean may i don't think trouble the district else. attorneys and or your honor a witness okay she's very like what i'm not a witness guess what did the man say that he's the murderer that would to this in witness. this case <laughs> a material make witness. witness in this case that make you and finally your honor i'm going to ask for as as soon as possible i'm going to and ask he, that she these, may not have been in the room at the proceedings time proceedings be halted let's be let's be generous to the young lady maybe in fact she was not in the meeting at the time because there is some um testament or uh, disclosure if 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 you will take that that people were in and out that every the but there's a statement in the uh, motion that those particular individuals, Hilton and Love, the, the judge, Copeland, the witness, and the witness's attorney were the people that remained. So though others were in and out, those um, concentrated for folks were represented to be there the whole time. So she should have heard it if he said it. Until we can obtain it. an accurate Maybe he didn't final say we don't know the transcript. Facts for what occurred yeah, where well, none of the defense, been. none of the defendants or defense counsel were present for, um, and also the recordings of that meeting so we can see where we are. Again, I'm not gonna sit up here and make false accusations or spurious allegations, but I do think we need to figure out what happened. We need to be in the know and not in the dark about what happened when a meeting occurs with a witness that has been sworn in and um, we're not invited to the party. So those are my requests, Your Honor. Um, I think it's I think it's necessary at this time to put a halt to these proceedings. I am moving for a mistrial. I have not waived anything. I just found out about this information. It is timely, and and that's our stance, Your Honor. Thank I've you. I've noted your motion for mistrial. It's denied. Okay, I'll um uh, uh, same thing. You want the Harvey? Mr. Okay, all right. I don't know that a judge could really do that. You have six defendants, and so. You know, every attorney gets to get a, come up and speak their mistrial concerns. I think that the only thing is represent that you're in a joinder. So you would say, I joined the, the previous mistrial. 
we, we join in so that you're not replicating all of the arguments. However, if you have other arguments, other salient arguments you want to add, you can, or you can put a whole new mistrial motion for it. I don't understand why the judge thinks it's like, okay, you joined in. Okay. Okay. Everybody's on the same page. Okay. Okay. You're all denied versus everybody get up and okay. come to what it is. All right. Okay. Okay. So they're just joining. Okay. Good. Okay. All right, sir. I hate that he coughs right there. Cause I'm I'm gonna just be be a conspiracy conspiracy theorist. Um I feel like he coughs right there so that this guy is not heard. Because he's adding other issues. So he joins into the previous motion for mistrial and he starts asserting something else and he coughs over it. We can't hardly hear him. And he knows we can't hear him. Because it's not his mic is not on. We <laughs> so we were not made aware of something. <laughs> my suspicions that that was likely what was going on, but I could not reduce that to a fact of when the court came out, the court of uh, that based upon, again, ex parte, we don't have to know the substance all the time. But just the fact that there was uh, that meeting, Your Honor, would have at least put us on some notice that there was something that was going on even beforehand. Uh, I thought that would have been the appropriate move, but nonetheless, Your Honor, I'm asking the court for this trial. I believe that it's appropriate here. Thank you. Right. Okay, so he's just adding improper notice or no notice thereof relative to the ex party hearing. And that was the substance of what he added. Um, just illuminating that his mistrial motion is based on facts and substance of everything else, but just also adding the, to, re, to make sure to highlight the fact that not only did they not get a pre notice that, that there would be a mis, um, an ex party hearing, once they got into the room and trial started, it was never disclosed that there was an ex party hearing. So um, failure to notice defendants properly is what he's adding. Motion for mistrial denied. Um, Ms. D. Williams? All right, thank you, madam. Motion's denied. Mr. Garner? Okay, so noted. All right. Sounds like they're just adopting the previous um, motions and facts and and going in as joiners, basically. They're joining in the, the motion from the spot. Okay. Overall motion. Ms. Steele, last time. Probably Steele's Who motion. told you? So now he's going back. All right. Mr. Steele's in, uh, in custody. And so he's going to put him in custody. Um, and uh, once he clears the area, I mean, we'll, go on trial. We'll, we'll get custody. started. We'll just go ahead and get started without him. So question to the world of common sense. Think this, I, and this is why I say it's just not that far apart. Common sense. This gentleman is represented by an attorney over here, an attorney over here. Realize that under more circumstances than not, when you have more than one attorney, those attorneys are taking different aspects of the caseload. They're not taking the overall case collectively. So problem becomes when you remove one attorney and you only have one in representation this is a murder trial this is a rico trial this is like one of the highest right so this is not fraud or you know uh misdemeanor this is felony and it's murder and rico high crimes so excuse me please explain to me when you take away one attorney and you leave one behind do you not think you have uh unjustly prejudice the defendant from proper representation. And the reason why I say that is because Mr. Steele might have um, interviewed all the witnesses in this case. And this other gentleman whose name I don't know might have wrote, written all motions in this case, or they took half of witnesses here and half of witnesses there. So then when this witness gets on the stand and says, yes, we, I met this person here. I did this, that. I this this the information that Steele would know is not going to be readily available to the other counsel to be able to be like oh wait a minute objection we have a problem 
your honor, he's perjuring himself on the stand because quite actually we have a declaration. And in fact, they didn't meet each other until 20 years later, or they just met five years ago. Or they didn't. Like you can't argue any parts of the case or um, come against any of the details when the full representatives are not availed of the testimony. And this testimony, of course, seems to be so important because the prosecution needs him to be him to testify. They won't they won't prosecute him if he lies. They won't they gave him full immunity probably because he's immune from lying on the stand. He's immune from doing anything wrong as long as he does not say that he killed the guy and does not um, hurt their face, right? So he's important to them. Consequently, it's important for the defendant to be um, fully represented at that time. Yeah, we're going to continue. I'm not called nothing. I'm not, I'm not trial, uh, you, you don't have that luxury at this point in time, sir. You don't. You don't. You don't have that luxury. So he's saying, I refuse to participate if steel is not available because he's like, we are tandem. We work hand in hand together. And the judge is like, no, you don't get to, you're not off the trial. You're not off the case. You don't have that luxury. Uh, argumentatively, they're probably both right. Just depends on how things land when it comes down to the ex party hearing. Because the contemptuous uh, order is based upon privilege. So if you're wrong in holding him in contempt, then you're wrong for proceeding with the case. You don't have that luxury at this point in time. You don't. Yeah. Sir, that sir, you you all are re you all are really getting yourselves cross purposes at this point in time. I, I sir, I'm telling you, you are at this point in time. You made some things out of nothing. I think that you're I think that you're on very precarious ground at this point in time. So, I'm telling you at this point in time, he's in custody. We're going to go ahead and start. You can represent Mr. Williams. That's okay. That's fine. I'll take up the other stuff as uh, the as judge needed. But may I'm not, not going to take it up right now. Say again. Sir, you have to. No, I think well, you, I think he's just you're going to have to do the you're going to have to do the best you can at this point in time because you don't get to extort the court. That's what you're attempting to do at this point in time, sir. Yes, you are. What you're trying to do is I'm not going forward if I don't get this. You know, it, it doesn't work that way, Mr. Adams. And I and, and, I, and I'm and I'm telling you at this point in time, I, I would I would just kind of govern yourself accordingly, sir. I'm telling you, as the court. Under these particular circumstances, everything will come out as it as it as it as it should. I don't think I don't. It will come out, won't it? <laughs> we'll just find out what's in that wash when we're done. But a couple of things: <laughs> the court is like you're you're treading in the wrong direction. You're making something out of nothing. Problem is, you won't allow it to present so that they know it's nothing. So they're like, wait, you're saying it did happen? So they're like a dog with a bone. They're going to hold on tight to this because they're zealously advocating for their client throughout the process. So whereas the court says it's nothing um, and you're just blowing it out of proportion, as defense counsels, the defense counsels, like anything that gets my client off is my responsibility. If, the, if any right is being um, trampled over that belongs to my client, it's my responsibility to highlight that to the court and to, to hammer it through. Um, and I was thinking, well, maybe he didn't know that Donovan stated he would admit to the murder. Maybe he didn't hear that. And I don't know if he heard that. And I'm not sure if, John, if, if Copeland did, I mean, not Donovan, Copeland, the witness Copeland, I'm not sure if Copeland did say it, but that's what was conveyed to the defense. And defense counsel was like, if he said that, that's a problem. We need to find out. We need to know. We need to investigate this now. And the court just is like, no, no, no. Like, get over it. You're, you're acting like a crybaby just because you weren't in the room. And they're like, no, it's not just about not being in the room. It's about the substance of what was in the room. Sounds like a problem. Sounds like really, really, really big problem. And he's like, no, it's, no, it's not. It's not that big deal. So it's just, he heard it. I want to give the judge, like, some reasonable doubt. Like, you know, you don't want the judge to be, like, complicit. But... But Ben still blurts out. So judge says, we're in recess. Ben still blurts out. Copeland, tested, Copeland reveals that he is the one who murdered Donovan. ADA Love is like, well, shaking her head. They're like shaking her head. Judge gets off the bench. Judge does not turn around and say, what did you say, counselor? Back on the record. What did you say? Copeland says that he da 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 Counselor, that is a complete misrepresentation of what was in my chambers. And this is why it is important and imperative for you to tell me who is telling you this information. For they have lied to you and given you the highest falsity. That didn't happen. 
right? He just kept going off the bench. So there's some implied like acquiesce, you know, like he's ask, acquiescing to um, what was potentially said, but I don't know that that actually is on the official record. Hey. Yada, 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 yada. Sure. Sir, I don't have enough information at this point in time to address it. I don't. You won't even but, take but I'm it. telling you at this point in time, there is nothing that was <laughs> Just given, believe me. said. <laughs> oh, I love his response this to this morning. too. Listen yeah. to his response. Is there any um, accuracy to some of the information that we But sir, I don't even know. Your 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 co counsel, your co counsel won't even tell me who said who said whatever. Okay. Okay. And 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 the ch the challenge I'm having in this particular circumstance is that is such a violation of the sacrosanctness of the court's chambers and an ex parte conversation. You're you're just glossing over that. You're glossing over that in its entirety. No. It's not, sir. Sir. That's not what. That's 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 not what happened. That's that's not what. That's not what happened. That's not what happened. That's not what happened. I'm just telling you, that's not what happened. Judge, uh, respectfully, um, we are not obligated to simply accept that there's been no violation. We believe that there has been. And the only okay, well, then you've made. So they're like, we believe the rights have been trampled over. We believe this is issue. We believe this was said. And he's like, that's not what happened. That's not what happened. It didn't happen. That's not what happened. And he goes, well, I guess, Judge, respectfully, we ain't got to believe you. <laughs> you have to prove it. You, you made it. You made it. No, we're not doing that at this point in time. So you, you'll have a choice to make. All right, take Mr. Take Mr. Steele into custody, please. John, would the court afford me one moment to um, confer with counsel regarding the appropriate remedy in this type of situation? Okay, all right. So this is when DA love, ADA love goes. Let me talk because, you know. Yes, sir. You certainly may. Mr. Williams does not wish to go forward without me being here. You are removing me against um, his will, my will. And you're taking away his right to counsel. And you're conducting material parts of this trial without me present. And I can't learn about it by watching online. So for that reason, additionally, I asked for a mistrial. And I assume you deny, but I'd like you to deny our motions for mistrial. You deny the other people. I've, I've, I've denied your motion, but I'll certainly take that under advisement, sir. Okay, so ADA Love goes out and starts talking um, to counsel. She We're going to be in recess for the next five minutes. Yeah, okay. They confer with counsel to determine, um, basically they come to a conclusion, having him locked up in the middle of the hearing, in the middle of the testimony, in the middle this is like problematic. He needs to be present. So I guess they go back to the um, judge. I don't know if it's on hearing or not, but they get back to the judge. At least let him stay um, throughout the day um, to hear the testimony. Because what he just also put down was, you're removing me against my client's desire to have me present. And material things are transpiring that I cannot watch online. I cannot find out secondhand and consequently it will affect my ability to represent my client this is very true because he gets to uh view the witness testimony hear the testimony and view the witness as the witness testifies so the role the eyeing of the roles of his uh, the rolling of his eyes the throwing up of the hands the shoulder kick all become relative to him he can uh make a motion to have the court reflect that the body language of the witness is expressing a disregard for the question by um, flipping his shoulder or putting up the bird or waving his hands around or rolling his eyes. He can put that on the record, even though the witness is not his witness. Um, he can ask for a motion for that. But you cannot do that if you cannot see the witness. And even if he watched it online, we saw for ourselves that Hilson is walking in front of the camera. The camera is not always in the best position. It seems like there's some tightness relative to um, presentability of witness to, to the camera, to the public. So even if it was something that he could watch online, he obviously could not guarantee that he's getting the best viewing of the witness at all times. And then if there's things that's materially happening outside of the witness and outside of the um, jury, He's not able to represent his client relative to any particular motion. So they end up allowing him to stay. You guys heard that. I'm sure that's in the other video. He stays to the end of the day and he gets um, 
uh, Ashley Merchant and the other gentlemen involved from the Georgia Strike Force that helped to represent other attorneys in such matters. And they get on the record. Um, we went through that. That's in a different video as well. You can watch that. She did a great job. Um, nevertheless, certain uh, certain points, certain authorities that she cited, one of them was not really reviewed by the court. So I think that even though she cited it, it was overlooked by the court. However, um, the Supreme Court now has, now has his criminal contempt ruling. And they're going to deal with that. And we're back in trial with YSL. So, you know, fun times, I guess. I don't know. How do you feel about Little Woody? <laughs> Mr. Copeland's um, testimony. I just almost feel like the prosecution is dying on a sword that is rusty and hurtful. I just, his testimony, if I were a, a juror listening to his testimony, I would clock him out so far. I'd be dead. I'd be like almost asleep. He's interesting, yes, but substantively, I could not believe him because he's like, yeah, whatever, oh, whatever. Yeah, whatever. Oh, I, I talked to the, what do you say? I talked to, what was the guy's name? Tug? Tug? Whatever the, the, the policeman's name was. I talked to him and I lied to him because I didn't want to go to jail. I'd be sitting there going, oh, well, what you doing today? <laughs> what you doing right now? Telling the truth? I don't know. You, you tell this man. So anyway, what do you think? Is he worth the sword that they're dying on? Their whole case is here. He is a witness and they have given him immunity. They have had ex parte hearing where he, he's gotten immunity from uh, being truthful. <laughs> he doesn't have to be truthful on the stand and all these other things. Or just from the basis of his testimony. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? All right, Lyric Armstrong, your real estate agent advocate. Until the next video.